Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's third day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2019. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on for Hired Vehicles, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Ruben Diaz, Sr. Uh, we're joined today by Councilmember Diaz, Councilmember Vallone, Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Matteo, Councilmember Adams, and Councilmember Grudenchik. Today we'll hear from the Taxing and Limousine Commission and the Department of Environmental Protection. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing to together, including the Director, Latanya McKenney, Committee Counsel, Rebecca Chasen, Deputy Directors, Regina Pareda ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Head, Chima Obercheri, and Krillian Francisco, uh, Finance Analyst, John Basile and John Seltzer, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, and Roberta uh, Catarano, who pull everything together. Thank you for all your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 24th, beginning at approximately 4 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at uh, finance testimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the Taxi and Limousine Commission. TLC's fiscal 2019 executive budget is $52 million, 100% of which is city funds. This represents a 9% decrease in the agency's budget since the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. I'd like to commend the administration for heeding the council's call to have the budget more accurately reflect the likelihood of receiving revenue from the sale of taxi medallions in the current plan. Until the executive plan was released, the budget showed anticipated revenue for fiscal 19 of $107 million, a sum that was not realistic given that the city has no immediate plans to sell any taxi medallions. At today's hearing, I look forward to learning about the TLC's assessment of the e-hail industry and the long-term impact that it may have on the city's tax industry, particularly since TLC is anticipating a decrease in hail licenses for fiscal 2019. I also hope to hear testimony about the future of the Green Grants Program, which provides grants to green cabs which become wheelchair accessible. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I'll now turn the mic over to my co-chair, council member Diaz, for his statement, and then we will hear from the TLC commissioner, Mira Joshi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and welcome to the joint hearing of the City Council Finance Committee and for Hire Vehicle Committee on the fiscal year 2019 executive budget. I'm Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr. and I am the chair of the For Hire Vehicle Committee. <clears throat> Before we begin, I would like to thank the chair of the Committee of Finance, my colleague Council Member Daniel Drum who, by the way, Council Member, you have been doing a wonderful job sitting here every day, listening to everybody, all, all the committees, and controlling everything. So congratulations. Uh, you have, you have, have been, been doing a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Today, we will hear testimony from the Taxi and Limousine Commissioner, Ms. Mary Josie, on the T taxi and t on the TLC expense budget for fiscal year 2019. TLC budget proposed a budget of 52 million for fiscal year 2019. This constitutes a 9% decrease from fiscal year 2018, which was 59.5 million, 57.5 million. The decrease is mainly, mainly associated with the lackluster participation in the five borough taxi initiative, which is generally used to help owners offset the cost of retrofitting or making their vehicle wheelchair accessible. The commission also reduced its headcount by 72 full-time positions 
when compared to the to last year adopted budget. In the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget, TLC include, included anticipated revenue of one $107 million from taxi medallion sale. While the executive budget has since pushed the expected revenue from taxi medallion out beyond the five years financial plan, it still anticipates collecting the revenue sometimes after 2022. The committee hope to hear the committees hope to hear from the commission on how it anticipates generally this future revenue and what TLC outlook is for yellow medallion values. The committee look forward to, hear, to hearing from the commission on its wheelchair accessibility plan for both medallion taxis and for higher vehicles. Finally, send the TLC issue issue its first for higher vehicle based license to Uber in 2011. App based companies have dramatically increased in popularity. The committees are interested in hearing from TLC outlook and forecast on the future for this thriving industry and its impact in the medallion taxes and the rest of the industry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and back to you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for your very kind words. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to ask Council to swear in our panel and then uh, ask um, uh, them to begin. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Uh, good morning, Chair Drum and Chair Diaz and members of the four higher end finance committees. I am Mira Zoshi, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Thank you for inviting me to present the TLC's propo proposed executive budget for fiscal year 2019. With me today is Jennifer Tavis, our Deputy Commissioner for Finance and Administration. The TLC's proposed budget is $52 million, which will help the agency continue to regulate New York City's growing for hire industry in ways that protect passengers, drivers, and ensure accessible for hire transportation for all New Yorkers and maintain our enforcement efforts to protect customers and driver income. Today, all TLC licensees are required by TLC regulations to provide equivalent service to passengers in wheelchairs, but we have not yet achieved this goal. The most progress has been made in the yellow medallion sector, where the city's goal is to have a 50% accessible yellow taxi fleet by 2020. Similarly, city's green taxis are under an accessibility mandate. Now more passengers in wheelchairs can hail an accessible taxi because more wheelchair accessible vehicles or waves are circulating, but there's still room for improvements. TLC also operates an accessible dispatch program which provides passengers the opportunity for a safe, reliable ride in an accessible yellow or green taxi, all at the metered fare. Although the accessible dispatch program originally served only Manhattan, it was recently expanded to include trips in all five boroughs, and we'd be happy to provide information and materials about this expanded service to the members. We have also been working with the MTA as it's expanded opportunities for green and yellow taxis to participate in MTA's pilot to use taxis for on-demand service, providing additional income streams for drivers. Taxis are currently doing about 5,000 accessoride trips each weekday and about 2,500 trips on Saturdays and Sundays, and we're excited by the possibilities offered by this participation for passengers, owners, and drivers. We appreciate the interest we've received from council members about deepening our collaboration with the MTA, and we welcome your support. While we've made significant strides for accessibility, we recognize there's more to be done. 
the yellow and green taxi sectors are significantly ahead of the four higher sectors, which have not met the equivalent service mandate for years. The accessibility gap has become greater as the number of for hire vehicles, virtually all of which are not wheelchair accessible, has increased by many tens of thousands. For this reason, the TLC recently passed rules that will require for hire vehicles to dispatch a growing percentage of trips to wheelchair accessible vehicles. The rules will take effect July 1st, and the administration is confident that they will greatly increase the number of wheelchair accessible vehicles in circulation. All New Yorkers should have a safe and reliable transportation within an equitable time frame. I'd also like to up you, update you on the administration's efforts to address inequities in driver income. Although there are more trips in TLC licensed vehicles, the number of licensed drivers has outstripped demand. At the same time, drivers' expenses are significant, as many drivers lease or purchase vehicles so that they can drive for the app and are then burdened with the cost of vehicle payments in addition to all of the other costs involved in operating vehicles, such as insurance and gas. The TLC has been collecting and reviewing data to better understand the driver's expenses and income. The administration's goal is to establish a regulatory framework to protect drivers' income and provide them with the right level of transparency so they know exactly what and how they are being paid and when they are underpaid. Turning now to our budget for fiscal year 2019. Um, it totals 52 million. This amount is comprised of 38 million in personal services and 14 million in other than personal services. This total is about 8.9 million less than the preliminary budget I presented to you in March. The decrease is attributable to TLC's contribution to citywide savings, including a hiring delay, a one-time reduction of 72 vacancies pending our joint efforts with the Department of Citywide Services to more effectively recruit new safety and admission and enforcement inspectors. Additionally, this revised total budget represents a $7 million increase in funding for our green grant program to reflect demand for these grants. Finally, our projected revenue budget for fiscal year 2019 is $57.3 million. As we noted in our preliminary budget, the city has reviewed the continued presence of future medallion auctions in the budget. This executive budget addresses the matter by removing the medallion revenue from our fiscal 2019 budget and delaying medallion sales beyond the five-year financial plan. This change allows the city to continue to monitor the medallion market and does not foreclose any medallion auctions at a future date. We expect that licensing will continue to be our largest source of revenue. Beginning in January 2016, we began licensing drivers for up to three-year term instead of a two-year term, and these three-year licenses will come up on their first renewal during fiscal year 2019. Therefore, revenue from driver's license renewals will be down for the first half of fiscal year 2019. We'll monitor revenue during the year and work with OMB on any adjustments to that projection. In conclusion, this has been a time of increased attention on the for hire industry, particularly on financial challenges faced by drivers in the taxi and for hire sectors. We appreciate the Council's longstanding interest in examining policies to support drivers. We look forward to working with you on this and other topics as we continue our work to make sure that over our over one million passengers a day enjoy safe and reliable transportation and to improve conditions for our 180,000 licensed drivers. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and I am now able to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, let me just start with taxi medallion sales. In fiscal 19, uh, the anticipated revenue of $107 million um, for the sale, um, they, we were anticipating $107 million in the sale of medallions. Uh, I know that uh, you mentioned that it's going to be pushed further out or beyond in the five-year financial plan, but it doesn't actually say um, what the expected revenue to be raised further on would be, just delaying the timing. Um, so what are the latest plans for the future of the medallion sales? Um, I think it's significant. Um, there have been prior modifications to the medallion sales, which sort of pushed one year, two years. Um, the significance of pushing it beyond the five years is to really create the space 
um, for us to have a better understanding of where the medallion market will be in several years. Uh, and that's important given the amount of change that's gone on. Even this year, prices have come down and medallion transactions has gone, have gone up in number. We're at a higher volume this year um, at this point than we were last year at this point. So there's a lot of fluidity and change, um, and it's important, I think, for the city to have a better sense of that before um, putting the medallions into the concrete budget that we focus on in the next five years. So if you say that the medallion sales have um, gone up, but the price has gone down. The volume of sales, right, transactions. So are you carrying the 107 million forward? Because then you're not going to hit that if the price has gone down. The 107 million, as well as the other years where revenue had previously been allotted, are, have all been pushed out beyond the five years, and so are obviously going to be subject to additional modification as OMB reviews circumstances. But yes, the the price the prices have come down considerably, um, and it's hard to say what what exactly if we were to have a medallion sale this year, the right number to put in the budget would be. So what type of um, changes in the taxi market have to happen uh, to allow the city to sell additional medallions? One of the biggest obstacles today in, tra in any medallion transaction is lack of a, a lending community. This is a market that depended heavily on leveraging. Um, there would be very small down payments and very large loans, and there was many lending institutions that were comfortable with that and gave out large, um, large loans. Um, some of those institutions have been taken over by regulators for unsound banking practices, and others um, have on their own decided not to continue to lend in this market. Without an, an ability to borrow money, there's always going to be a depression in price. So the transactions we see now are primarily cash transactions of drivers. Um, but the primary, uh, the primary mover here is not the dollar amount, it's really the trip volume and where the passengers are. And uh, there's been a switch in where passengers patronize. They patronize a lot of the app services, and many of those are people that used to patronize taxi service. Um, so the, I think the, the key thing is um, monitoring trip volumes, um, uh, an in, a renewed interest in the lending market, as well as um, the taxi business uh, taking opportunities that it has to um, a, sort of build the business strategy that's akin to what they see customers enjoying now. So, for instance, we just passed a pilot that will allow the taxi apps to give um, one of the benefits that, say, Uber and Lyft customers have, they order an Uber or Lyft car and they can see what the price is up front. They make a decision based on that price. So now the um, apps that work in taxis and any other apps that want to come into that uh, field can also provide that same customer service for passengers. Um, and because that's what people are relying on now to make decisions, we hope that this is an opportunity. We've also done a lot in terms of uh, uh, updating regulations to give uh, yellow medallion owners more freedom in what vehicles they buy, not requiring them to have the partition, allowing them um, to run their vehicles for longer, and uh, lowering the transfer tax, which was something that this council did, um, which was very much appreciative and, and does, does feed into the current volume of of transactions we're seeing today. So we'll continue to work with the industry and find ways that we can um, make operating that business easier for them and continue to give them opportunity so that they can pro provide customers with some of the amenities that the apps are providing them that customers appear to like very much. So what would be your assessment of the e-hail industry now and um, what it would look like in the future? Um, it is certainly growing. We bring on 3,000 new drivers and 2,000 new cars every month, and most of those cars and drivers are going to work for app companies. Um, it is the, the, you know, the sort of broad assessment, um, especially that what I've read from people that have studied this, is that there is going to be uh, more 
pool of passengers that are taking public transportation as shared rides become more common and as the price point keeps going down. So I think you'll see uh, a continued grow, growth of that passenger base, but also into, an, into areas that haven't, we haven't traditionally thought of as taxi customers, um, because when the price point gets closer and closer to what it costs to take a subway, many people are going to opt to take a shared ride in a private vehicle instead. I have to tell you, the first and only time I've ever taken an e-hail ride, I opened the door to the car and there was somebody else sitting in there. It was very shocking <laughs> to see yes. like, what are you doing here? Well, New York City, I think, is slow to pick on, I mean, to, to catch on to shared rides. It's something that can be done in the taxi industry as well as the inhale industry. But we are seeing from our data um, that it is actually picking up, um, and there are more people in New York City that are sharing, sharing rides. Um, and it's another place where we'd like to make sure the taxi has the opportunity to take advantage of that market as well. So overall, how do you see the yellow um, cab industry faring? The yellow cab industry, to the extent it, it, it's a hail industry, which it is primarily and has been for decades, um, has a, a very a, a real solid core in Manhattan. Because of the density, it is often easier to get a yellow cab than it is to order something on your phone. Um, I do sometimes see people ordering on their phone as they watch yellow cabs go by, and I wonder. But it really is easier. Um, and then there's going to be uh, the, the, what we'll have to see is how the yellow cab industry is also able to take care, take advantage of other opportunities like partnerships with the MTA and other partnerships that provide additional streams of income as well as additional service outside of Manhattan, probably through the apps because that is the easier way to get service outside of Manhattan. So um, I see Manhattan remaining the core business of the yellow medallion industry, but I do see the yellow medallion industry branching out to take advantage of some of the other income streams. Okay, good. Let's talk a little bit about the wheelchair accessibility that you mentioned in uh, your testimony. Uh, to date, how much funding assistance has the commission provided? In terms of grants? Um, yeah, there's a 20% of street hail licenses or wheelchair accessible? Sure. So let me give you the broad outline of the program. I'm going to defer to my deputy commissioner for the exact figures. There's yellow uh, cab grants that we give out, which add up to about $30,000. They're given $15,000 when they hack up the car to defray the cost of purchase, and then um, about $4,000 every year to cover the maintenance. We launched last year the same program for the green taxis. They're given $30,000, 15 when they hack up the car, and then $4,000 every for four years to cover maintenance and other costs. In total, um, I'm going to defer to my deputy commissioner to give you the totals of how much has been given out in each category to date. Uh, so uh, originally, just turn on that mic, and if you could just identify yourself also. I'm Jennifer Tavis, deputy commissioner of finance and administration of the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Uh, we were initially awarded 54 million uh, to make grants to support these efforts. Uh, 1,266 grants have been awarded since 2013. 18.7 million dollars are represented by those grants. Uh, we have, as you saw in the budget, received uh, cuts of 7 million in this current fiscal year and 7 million in fiscal year 19. And uh, the, we anticipate that we will still have sufficient funds to cover the grants uh, and the level of interest that we are seeing. So you, you call that a cut, it's quote unquote a savings mm -hmm. in terms of the $7 million because of a lack of interest in the program, am I right? Yes, that's accurate. OMB is looking at what we are actually spending compared to what we were allocated during the fiscal year. They have seen the demand for these grants reduce, and they have removed funding accordingly. So what do you anticipate will happen moving forward to 20 to 22? Oh, I think one important uh, change in the coming years versus last year is 
We passed at the end of December a package that requires the for hire industry to provide wheelchair accessible service, and they can use green taxis to provide that service. So for those bases that um, are going to fulfill their mandate um, and are looking for ways to do that, uh, that, per, that comes with some built-in funding, the green taxis are the best option. And in, although our funding was cut, we still have about 2.4 million, I believe. Is that right, 2.9 million? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's about, hang on, let me look that up. Um, to cover green grant requests. And obviously, if it looks like we have more requests than we have funding, we'll go back to work with OMB to make sure we have the money. Um, but we are very hopeful that people that need to meet this new mandate will take advantage of the opportunity because for the individual drivers and owners, it's a great small business model. Uh, they can get dispatches from the base. They can provide service for wheelchair passengers, but they also can pick up hails on the street, which lets them independently run their, you know, have a little more control over their income. Okay, thank you. I just want to uh, say that we've been joined by Councilmember Constantinides. Councilmember Cornegy, Councilmember Moya, and we have questions from, uh, excuse me, we're going to go to Chair, Chair Diaz, and then we do have questions after that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, how are you doing today? Very good. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm going to talk, I'm going to, I want to talk about legacy. You know, legacies. Uh, when you came to be the commissioner, the taxi, the yellow industry, the medallion, I believe, was worth $1.5 million. Now it's about $200,000. The industry is going down. People are killing themselves. Is that the legacy you want to leave when you leave? Well, you're in this with me too now. Huh? You're in this with me too now. No, I just can't get it like that. My legacy, I'm planning to live, to, 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 to live a legacy. I think your legacy is what all these people wearing yellow hats are waiting yes. for. My question to you is, it was $1.5 million. Now it's $200,000. People are killing themselves. When I was interviewed by this council at my hearing before I was appointed, I talked about things that I thought were important to accomplish. One of them was accessibility. The other one was working in, on the illegal commuter van industry. Another one was making sure that the agency had enough data. And another one was vision zero. And another one was driver income. And I think we've done incredible work in all of those. And I can go through each one of them if you'd like me to. Accessibility, I think I gave a very good summary in my testimony. On commuter vans, just yesterday was introduced yet another bill that will help us on commuter van enforcement. We have also started in a forfeiture program last year, and as a result, have seized and forfeited over 40 illegal commuter vans and worked very closely with the commuter van industry about, to make sure that we get the, there. What about the yellow families, uh, people that have... Let me finish. You asked about my legacy, so yeah, I'm going the yellow, through it. And, the yellow. And, and we talked about driver income, which is something we're working on, and Vision Zero, which is we've done incredible work on enforcement and limiting driver hours. I, uh, what I've said from the beginning, and I said at my hearing, and I've said every year since then, is the city has a vested interest in making sure there's publicly available, accessible service. And that is promoting that industry that provides it, which is the yellow taxi industry. And so we've taken incredible steps to help promote that that service continue. We don't peg a value to the medallion, what medallions are bought and sold at. We look at the service. We want to make sure the service is available. Um, independently, banks and buyers and sellers are free to look at data to make their own decisions about what the price is. And the price did go up very high, not all due to s pure market um, forces. There were several individuals who self-admittedly 
bought and sold and bought and sold to increase the value of the medallion so they could therefore increase the amount of a loan they could take out afterwards. So that's a certain amount of inflation that has no relation to the value of the asset underlying it. Today we see almost a negative correction. There's no lending around. So all of the transactions are going to be are going to be without financing and all cash, which is certainly going to depress the value of it. So the value of the medallion is something that definitely the financial world is in a key to. What that translates to the city is, is there service out there? Are people able to get service? Are people who use wheelchairs able to hail accessible taxis? And that's happening today a lot more than it was happening four years ago. I just want to be sure that when you leave, you leave, you leave, you leave behind a good legacy. I sleep well at night. Thank you. Uh, I don't. Uh, believe me, I don't. When I see people killing themselves, I cannot sleep well. I got, I can't even sleep. But thank you. Uh, praise God that you are sleeping well while people are killing themselves. No more questions. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're now going to move to questions from members. Uh, Councilmember Adams, followed by Councilmember Constantinidis, and then Moya. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, I just have a couple of questions for you uh, regarding illegal street hails. Uh, how many of the Commission's staff are currently dedicated to combating illegal street hails? We have an enforcement staff that's in the field every day. We have definitely vacancies there, but it comprised about, about 150 officers. Um, they are split among all five boroughs 24 seven. So as you can see, it's not a hell of a lot of coverage, but they try to be as strategic as possible to make sure that they are providing equivalent enforcement throughout the city and also responsive to complaints about particular hotspots. Do you see um, or do you anticipate hiring additional enforcement agents? We do. We have um, vacancies that we can fill even with the 72 heads that we've lost and we're actively working with DCAS to make sure that those vacancies are filled. Okay. Um, I'm just going to relate a little bit to you about my area specifically. I know that um, my colleague, Councilmember Miller, has also expressed our concern in Southeast Queens um, for the enormous saturation of cars, specifically dollar vans, illegal uh, vans, illegal cars, uh, black cars, um, that pretty much have taken over our corridors, uh, specifically uh, the Jamaica Core, downtown Jamaica Core. Um, I'm just curious to know how how enforcement has been beefed up in the area. Um, I'm a daily commuter, and for me, it's still very, very intense. Um, I need to know and understand the regulation behind these black cars uh, with out-of-state license plates that pretty much run the roads, uh, and uh, pedestrian safety is an extreme issue in downtown Jamaica. Uh, those of us that drive and walk uh, it's it's very very dangerous situation. So I would really really appreciate your feedback on that situation. Sure, and especially with the out of states, we've seen a lot more Texas and PA state uh, license plates. New Jersey is also extremely. Um, we we do what we can with our resources, and we also partner with um, MTA, Port Authority, NYPD, and now the sheriff's office to try to use their law enforcement resources in combination with ours. In Southeast Queens in particular, we've done um, a few of what we call surge operations where we'll deploy almost all of our staff to those problem areas to really set a tone. Unfortunately, people come back and we will continue to do those surge operations, but they need to know that we're aware of it and we're working actively on it. We've uh, done the forfeiture program, which Set, we've seized many dozens of commuter vans. Those, instead of paying a bond and getting that van back, which is what used to happen, there's no bond. We retain that van and then we sell it at a civil auction um, months later. Uh, in addition, we have seen a 
proliferation of larger 20 seat plus buses that are operating illegally, which we don't have the jurisdiction to stop. But through Jumani, uh, Council Member Jumani Williams and I believe Danique Miller um, and a few other council members, have, a bill was introduced yesterday that will give us that jurisdiction. Um, and we're anxious to be able to do that enforcement work because it's extremely frustrating for our officers to see those very dangerous vehicles holding lots of passengers go by without any consequences. I, I agree with you a thousand. Um, but we would also um, like to, I can put you in touch with our deputy commissioner because if you have particular areas in your community that you need attention, um, we would like to be responsive to that and, and send our officers there. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you would allow me just one quick follow-up. How often are those surge um, operations performed in downtown Jamaica specifically? I, I wish there was a regular schedule, but given our resources, there isn't. Um, we did several a few months ago, um, but I'll certainly make sure that you have contact with our deputy commissioner who plans them um, so that you have, a, you have an idea of how frequently we're there. Okay, thank you very much. I will come back for the next round in behalf of our colleague, uh, Barry Grudenchik. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Constantinides. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Diaz. Commissioner, it's good to see you again. Um, you know my deep concern about leveling the playing field and making sure that as we see Uber add over, was it 80,000 cars now to the city streets? There, we license over 130,000 cars today. So, yeah, so we're talking about numbers when you come to congestion, to traffic, to public safety. These are deeply concerning numbers to me. Uh, and I know we share that goal, and I look forward to working with the chair to get something done. And I want to echo my colleague, Adrian Adams, uh, when she talks about enforcement. I see you have a hiring delay in place here. Is that also for enforcement agents? The hiring delay is um, that we were delayed in hiring, and yes, it is enforcement agents. A lot of it has to do with um, we, we call from a civil list, um, and when the list is expired, we have to work with DCAS to find alternate ways. Um, there's other, other issues regarding enforcement that have to do with compensation that make it difficult for us to recruit and retain officers. Um, they begin at a starting salary of about 38000 and they end up at a salary that's closer to 47000 with all of the like add-ons, but that's a much lower ending point than, for example, NYPD, DOC, sanitation, um, and they have a difficult job. They're doing car stops all day, which is some of the most dangerous law enforcement work there is. Um, and so we, we do lose a lot of officers when they hit that two, three, four year mark because they go over to other agencies. Uh, so, so it sounds like you need more money to increase salaries to make sure we, we can retain staff well, and we make sure we have enforcement. We can increase salaries without a <laughs> contract negotiation that allows for that, but that's ongoing now between OLR and the unions, and we're hopeful that there will be a room there for our officers to get a higher get a higher cap out salary, um, so they can be more you know more. Uh, aptly compensated for the level of work that they're doing. I mean, we definitely need, you know, for when it comes to illegal street hails, we need more enforcement. We need more agents on the street. We need to make sure that we're doing all of those things. Very quickly, because I'm running out of time, um, I don't see anything in here for the Taxi Smart Card. I know that's something we've talked about in the past. Is that program coming back? I know the seniors in my district are very interested. So will the smart card itself, that mechanism, um, they ran into a problem with the banks and they can't issue those cards anymore as, as credits against taxi um, fares. But the, uh, the city's uh, Department of Aging has received a grant to provide some funds for transportation for seniors and we're working with them on how they want to spend that and encouraging them to, uh, to allow seniors to use taxis, but we can fill you in on that too. If I can have one more question, Chair, thank you. Um, as Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, I'm glad that we're spending uh, less money um, by introducing electric vehicles. I'm very excited about that. I am a little concerned, though, that we are spending more money on heat, light, and <laughs> power. Um, yeah, uh, we're not always the landlord. Uh, you're not the landlord. No, not always. I mean, some one of our facilities where the one of our facilities where the rental 
uh, is a rental, actually two. Um, the only facility where we are, the landlord, is our Woodside facility. And are we looking at opportunities for 80 by 50 implementation uh, you know, for sustainability? We are certainly for our Woodside facility because their construction needs to be happen happening there. Um, the half of the building needs to come be come down and be rebuilt, and it is part of the zero emissions plan for a, what it, what that final building will be. So solar power, geothermal, something All of that. is consideration yes, there. It's a it's a very ambitious um, but achievable plan. Great, because I, I mean, I, when I see us spending thirty three thousand dollars more on heat, light, and power, that concerns me. Yes. We're definitely trying to get to a, a, an eighty by fifty goal. All right, thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Francisco Moya. Thank, thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you, Commissioner, um, for your time. I just have one quick question, and I brought this up at the last um, hearing. It's a big concern of mine as I'm seeing that we're approaching this, this bubble here. But do we have a mechanism to regulate uh, the leases uh, for the e-hails uh, like we do for the yellow cabs? Um, I just feel that there is a bubble approaching with these subprime leases, this bait and switch that's going on right now. And I feel that a lot of uh, these drivers that have gotten themselves in this are not going to be able to afford uh, to pay for these vehicles or when their leases are up, uh, get into another vehicle as well. And I just wanted to know if there was any mechanisms in place. Are you thinking about this uh, at all? Um, it is a problem, and I've seen some pretty horrendous leases where people end up at the end of the lease paying $80,000 for a $25,000 car. And worse than that, that money is deducted from their pay. So if they want to skip a payment and pay something else, like a hospital bill or whatever, they don't have that choice because it's automatically deducted from ha when they're paid by the company for the services. Um, so there's a couple different fronts we've been looking at that. Um, we have definitely referred um, you know, really egregious examples that have come to us to consumer protection agencies that handle consumer protection enforcement. Um, and we, on our own, um, will wor are working on a set of transparency rules, much like we do in the taxi world, where the driver is told up front what the costs are, what they would look at the end of the lease period, because it's important to understand what, what the bottom line is at the end of three years. Um, and in the taxi world, we've gone further, where we've capped the amount that the driver can be charged. Um, there we have the advantage of being able to license the person who is charging them, the agent. We don't have that same authority over the car dealerships. Um, so we have to really try to see how well we can make our transparency rules do a lot of that work. Um, but we, if you have examples um, and you have particular instances, we would love to hear about them because the more we get those examples, the more they inform the kind of transparency rules that need to be in place so drivers know how much it costs to get involved. We also did produce, and I don't have them with me today, but I can share them with you, Please. two flyers that say, because of a concern that drivers don't know how much it costs to get into the business, a flyer that says how much, you know, you want to drive a yellow taxi, this is what it costs, you want to drive an FHV, this is what it's going to cost, putting it all on one page so they can see up front that there's going to be commercial insurance, a car lease, fingerprinting, DMV checks, criminal background checks, our applications. And, you know, and a lot of times people don't think about that. They get an incentive offer, they take the incentive and they forget or they don't realize that there's a tremendous amount of other expenses that are involved in being in this business. Correct. Uh, I won't take up too much of uh, your time, but I, I just would like to follow up with you on a couple of these things that you mm -hmm. mentioned right now. And thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Carnegie. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, as the Chair of the New York City Task Force on uh, MWBEs, um, I just had a question as it relates to MWBEs. Uh, uh, if you could provide me and the committee with the MWBE percentages for TLC contracts for fiscal year 2017 and the projections for 2018 uh, and 2019. Yes, I'm gonna defer to my Deputy Commissioner of Finance Administration who will provide you with that information. Give us one moment. Give us sure, thank you. Well, actually, I'm not in charge of the clock, so. <laughs> 
I'll, I'll don't, yeah, don't, don't charge it for Don't this let it moment. count against my time, please, <laughs> yeah. uh, Chair. All right. Do you have it? Do you have it? Yeah. Sorry. Oops. It's dangerous. Thank you. Uh, so our MWBE utilization rate for FY17 was 24% of total procurements. And, and if you had the projections for 18 and 19, that would be great. Uh, I do not currently have the projections for 18 and 19, but we're happy to follow up. What is, what is the dollar amount associated with that, for, with 2017's allocation? That was 696,000 uh, in MWBE procurements out of a total of 2,862,000. Uh, so I, I will be um, requesting that I follow up from my committee's perspective okay. uh, with you on your, M, you know, the city has a very ambitious MWBE goal and we want to make sure that we can be helpful uh, in, in arriving at that goal. So I'd like to follow up with you for the projections for 18 and 19 as well. Okay. Okay. Actually, I just, uh, the projection for FY 2018 is 34.6%, uh, which is above the 30% uh, goal in Local Law 1. So that's act our, our actual, I think our projection under Local Law was, our goal was to hit 30% and we're at 34.6% now. So we're above where we were last year, obviously more to go, but we're headed in the right direction. Definitely, but I'd just like to follow up on a breakdown of what, what those contracts actually look sure. like. Absolutely. And where my committee can be helpful in uh, if you're having any areas uh, that could be bolstered in terms of that, I'd love to be able to be helpful. Yes, I mean, a lot of our procurements are smaller than other agencies, but it's no, no, you know, it's still a, a procurement with the city agency. It's worth something, and we really would appreciate the help to make sure we're recruiting and getting that information out to the right audiences. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, no, thank you for your leadership, and thank you, you know, to the chairman of this committee now. We know that this is not a black and white uh, agency. This is very tough because as we would like to enforce against illegal street hill, in a particular area, there's always another group who will be negative impact. If we increase penalty for illegal street hill, uh, because of the green, would like to see an increase of penalty in the Washington Heights or the Bronx. Then we have the liberty to say, you've been too tough with us. If we do the same thing in the Midtown area, then it's important for the yellow, but then the Uber and the other, they will say, nah, you know, we should have more flexibility. So we know that it's a situation that is not so easy to resolve, and I know that it requires leadership. When the penalty will increase for the legal street hill, going up to 10,000, only for the legal uh, uh, street hill in the Midtown area and the JFF case, how can you describe the numbers of tickets that have been going, giving, going so far at $10,000 for legal street hill in the Midtown area and JFK in LaGuardia? I, I can get you those exact numbers. What I can tell you today, as a follow-up, I can get you the exact numbers because the $10,000 doesn't apply to every illegal street hail. It applies only to those that are done in a TLC licensed vehicle, so it's a subset of our illegal street hail numbers. Um, but overall, in the um, central business district, uh, that's about 70% of our enforcement um, as opposed to the rest of Manhattan where that's about 30%. So there are definitely more, elite, you know, enforcement is done in the Midtown area and in the CBD area, but I'm happy to follow up with you on the exact number of tickets that are issued pursuant to that section which carries a penalty of $10,000. Um, and often if people choose not to go to a hearing, um, they will pay a much smaller amount in a settlement. It's still a substantial amount. It is not $10,000, though. Yeah. What will that take to give a, a, a period of grace or amnesty for drivers who owe thousands of dollars in fine 
And as you know, I, this is something that I've been bringing to your attention, not just now that I don't chair this committee, but I've been also having this discussion with you before when I used to chair also the Liberty Committee. Like, what does it take for us to work with you, TLC, identify numbers of drivers that they owe thousands of dollars that probably if we give a amnesty for them not to pay that money if the tickets are not related to public safety? It's hard to answer that question without knowing what that universe is because most of our tickets and certainly most of our tickets that carry heavy fines are for public safety, illegal or illegal activity. Um, so there are not ones that we would be prepared to give amnesty on. For many of the smaller violations like equipment, non-safety equipment violations, we've is started issuing warnings. Um, we've also started to issue notice of violations, so it's not a summons unless you fail to get it fixed. So it'd be, it would take some understanding of what that category is. We have payment plans um, for people that have outstanding um, of monies that's owed to us, and we have recently made them more generous. But for people that have um, thousands of dollars, and, and we can definitely assess to understand what that universe is, um, we would need to understand how many of them are actually for non-safety violations. Because if that group is really not non-safety violations, then an amnesty for that group wouldn't really have much effect to, to the people that are currently owing us money. Thank you. Uh, we have questions from Councilmember Gordenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have a lot of taxi drivers that live in my community. I, I know many people do. And one of the things I think is most promising, and you touched on it in your testimony, is um, allowing yellow cabs and green cabs to pick up excessive ride. And I just hope you could just expand on that a little and tell us how that's going. Sure, so um, as I said in the beginning, um, and in response to sort of where is the industry going, I think it's very important that we make sure there's opportunities for the yellow taxi industry to get streams of income beyond the traditional hail market as that hail market isn't as broad as it used to be a few years ago. And one of those opportunities is working with the MTA. So the, we, after years of working with the MTA, we finally got to a point where they agreed to send accessoride trips to green and yellow taxis. Um, that does a tremendous amount for the passenger. They're in a mainstream vehicle instead of a white bus. Um, and they've gone one step further and introduced on-demand service. So the passenger no longer has to wait three hours for the trip and book 24 hours in advance. And, and that's going um, very well. We had a meeting with several uh, members of the disabled community and, and one of them called Accessoride and said, I have to hurry up downstairs, they're gonna come in five minutes. And we were all pretty shocked, but this was the new on-demand taxi service. Um, for those trips that are done in an accessible yellow or green taxi, the MTA and the vendor have agreed to give the driver, I believe it's a $10 bonus, so that it's an extra incentive to take out an accessible taxi. And um, I, there's, this is uh, rapidly growing because when I looked at the numbers now are 5,000 uh, trips a day on a weekday and 2,500 on weekends. A few months ago, that was 3,000 trips a day. So. I think that the MTA and the, and, the, and the taxi industry are seeing a lot of opportunity here. Customer satisfaction, because there's also, um, the, since it's a pilot, they're looking at to see what customer satisfaction and fulfillment rates are, and they are very high, so that's also a, a good plus for Accessoride. There's a cost savings. Um, I think an Accessoride trip costs in the neighborhoods of upwards of 70 some dollars. Um, and a taxi trip, when you include in the administrative work that you need with the dispatcher, costs about $35. So that's a savings to the city and it's, to the state. It's a, it's a rare win, win, win for everybody. It's yes. a win for the consumer, it's a win for the taxi driver, and it's a win for the taxpayer because we're saving money. And I hope that we'll be able to expand this program 
um, and use, uh, you know, 5,000 is a lot of trips. In New York, 5,000 isn't much of anything, it's, but yes. it's now, a lot. Yes, there's a lot of room for growth, and this is an industry that certainly needs these opportunities for income enhancement. So we're, we're hopeful that the MTA will continue and grow. Thank you, and if program. there's anything I could do to help that, please, I'm not on. Keep saying your, uh, your voice, your public support for it. That I would will. be always you helpful. Hear me? Do you hear me here, Councilman? I'm, I'm looking at Chair Diaz. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Very good. I just have some uh, follow-up questions now on the Yellow Taxi Cab app. Um, do you have any details on how many riders currently use the app to hail yellow cabs? Uh, there are two apps right now. One's called Curb and one's called Arrow. Um, and I will follow up with you on what the daily ridership is. It is not tremendous. What most passengers are finding more convenient about the app is that they can pay for their their trip once they get in the cab. So once they get in the cab, they put in a code and they're done. Their tip is default set and they don't have to worry about pulling out a credit card at the end of the trip or paying in cash. So the higher volume of usage comes in the payment. Um, what we'll have to see is now that we've given them the ability to give upfront pricing and a little more price security, that whether those um, hail rates go up in the yellow taxi app world. Um, and I want to mention the app is also the way that the MTA is using them. So the app is the vehicle that connects the taxi to the accessoride passenger. How much did it cost to develop that app? I don't know because they're done by private industries. We set the specifications. Um, there are certain consumer protections that we want to make sure are there. There are certain privacy and security measures, but then it's an open market. Anyone can come in. So far, we've had two. We've got some interest from other companies, um, and I think the more the merrier. So the, the app is different in every circumstance to hail a yellow cab? I mean, to to do it, to use an app to get a cab? The, there, there are two companies that are operating. One is called Curb and one is called Arrow. If you download either of those apps, you can hail a yellow or a green taxi cab. And then once you've hailed it, your credit card is on file with the app, just like Ubers or Lyfts. And so once you get in the car, it's already synced up and your card's going to be charged, and then you leave after your trip, you don't have to exchange anything. Um, but you have a second feature with these apps. You can also just pay in a car that you've actually hailed yourself. Did you ever hear of Taxi to Go? Taxi to Go? To go. Um, I am not familiar with that, but I'm, I'm not, that doesn't mean that my policy staff hasn't been working with them. Um, but we'll, I'll certainly check for you. Okay, and um, do all yellow cab drivers have access to both um, apps? Yes, they can work with either one. And, and the apps have access to the entire fleet of yellow cabs and green cabs. Okay, so um, let me just go to carpooling. Um, can you describe that program for me uh, and how that works? In yellow or in? Yellow. Okay, yellow. in yellow, um, it's always been allowed if both passengers if agree to it, or the, really it's the first passenger. Um, but with the apps, you can do a lot of that online, which is how programs like Via or Uberpool or Lyft Line work. So for example, Curb, one of the apps, is working with Via um, so that if you request through the app, they say, okay, you'll get a discount if we match you with somebody else. Um, it's still in its very early stages. Uh, the car sharing is, is difficult to get off the ground in New York, but it is getting much more um, acceptable. Uh, so I'm hoping that, again, the recent pilot that we allowed for more freedom with the apps will also allow them to do car sharing um, in ways they haven't been able to. One of the aspects of car sharing that we've seen from the data is it's going on in the boroughs a, l a little bit, uh, other than like VIA, which only operates on that model, but those that don't, that operate in both worlds, their car sharing, actual shared rides happen more in the boroughs than they do in central Manhattan. So it may be that the greens who are in the boroughs can get more of that, or if there's yellows that are in the boroughs, um, which is not as common, that they would be able to do more of the car sharing work. Um, I do think it's gaining in popularity, and it would be smart for any of the app developers that are in this space um, to figure out how they can take advantage of that. Do you know the numbers for the yellow taxis? 
Do I know how many the, are participating in the program? In the in the yellow for the yellow cabs in the partnership to pick up um, any passengers. any yellow cab that is using, I believe it is curb. That is the any any yellow cab. So it's really up to the driver. So any driver that is using curb to pick up trips will also pick up these shared trips as well. They're just not a lot in number because they're functioning in Manhattan and it's really not the prime territory. Most people don't want to share a cab in Manhattan. They want to get where they want to get quickly. No, but do you know that? Do, would you know those numbers? Do they share those numbers with you? Um, I can check. I believe they do. So I can get them for you, certainly. That would be interesting yeah. to see as yeah, well. Yeah, because we require people to tell us every time there's an actual shared ride. So presumably we'll have those numbers as well. Okay. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about licensing uh, facility wait times. Mm -hmm. uh, the average wait time at the Long Island City licensing facility decreased 48% to 12 minutes during the four, first four months of fiscal 2018 when compared to the same period in fiscal 2017. How was TLC able to reduce the wait time by 48%? Um, you're talking about people when they get their actual physical license, mm -hmm. right? Um, Tremendous amount of work has been done to bring the process online. Drivers are mobile. They do a lot of things on their phones. We wanted to make sure that they were able to upload documents, check on the status of their application, um, and, and um, submit other pieces of information that are necessary to complete an application from their phone. And over the last year, we've gotten all of that integrated into our licensing system, and it's been incredible. Not only are the wait times down, but it's more customer satisfaction. It is a lot easier for people to upload their DMV abstract than to make a trip to wait in line to come and give it to us at our licensing facility. We also have opened up just as an aside, but it also has to do with customer service, a DMV facility within our licensing so that the medallion taxi owners who used to have to go to two or three spots in order to get their plates can just come to Fauci and we'll issue the plates for them right there and then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually heard of that. Okay. So let me also talk a little bit about inspection times. I think in, um, in 2017, you had, it was, the average time was 48 minutes, and then in uh, 2017, it went up to 58 minutes. Can you explain why um, it's taking longer? A lot more cars. It really is due to the fact that we have a lot more cars. Um, we have a certain number of lanes, and we also have um, the same number of staff. So we haven't had a real increase in the number of, of inspectors that are available to do this work. Okay, okay that's it for me. Uh, Chair, Chair Diaz? Mr. Chairman, as I said this morning, today I came in peace. So I don't want to ask no more questions. I just want to congratulate and express my appreciation to this to central staff, the staff of the uh, the committee, and my counsel, Christopher Lin, and all of the members that have been working with me. I'm happy, Mr. Com Mr. Chairman, because Yesterday, in the Village Voice, it came an article where the, our speaker, the Honorable Cory Johnson, has expressed yeah, it's his support to uh, regulate, regulate Uber. And he has shown that this, com that this city council and the committee on for hire vehicle has is his support and the support of the of the members, and I'm I'm, I'm happy I'm happy to hear that our speaker go publicly uh, speak, talking about the ills that has been done uh, to to yellow and to the industry and the, his willingness to correct those ill illness. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm happy. Okay, thank you very much. And I want to thank the panel for coming in. Uh, we're not going to adjourn this meeting uh, because we're going to continue a little bit later on with the second hearing with the EPA. But for now, I just want to say thank you for coming in and uh, 
We look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, and we'll follow up with the items that the several council members have asked us to follow up with, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2019. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Environmental Protection, chaired by Councilmember Costa Constantinidis. And we have been joined by Councilmember Adams, Councilmember Grudenchik, Councilmember Richards, and Councilmember Cohen. Um, and we just heard from the Taxi and Limousine Commission, and now we'll hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, Vincent Sapienza. In the interest of time, I will keep my remarks brief. DEP's fiscal 2019 executive budget totals $1.39 billion, a decrease of approximately $27 million over the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. I look forward to hearing more about the department's water rate setting process and how the DEP balances affordability while keeping pace with long-term capital construction demands and expenses related to water and sewer operations. Furthermore, I was glad to see funding in the executive plan to hire 19 staff for a rapid noise response unit. Hooray. In a city where noise pollution is all around us all the time, it's hard to address immediately. Uh, it's important for the DEP to have the necessary resources to uh, respond quicker. Uh, last, I look forward to discussing agency efforts to engage and educate our youth through internship programs. Funding was included in the current plan for an upstate program, but I am hoping to hear today that DEP offers such programs locally with our schools. Children are our, future environment, uh, children are our future environmental stewards and protectors of the earth, and we need to invest in them to support that growth. Before we hear testimony, I will open the mic now to my co-chair, uh, Councilmember Constantinidis. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, I'm very happy to chair this committee hearing with you today. Um, to hear from the Department of Environmental Protection. Commissioner, it's good to see you. Uh, and definitely looking forward to hearing about several and topic to important topics and issues, including uh, why certain council priorities were not included in uh, the DEP's executive plan, uh, their efforts to bolster renewable energy projects across the agency's vast building portfolio, and an update on general agency and procedures. Um, so, Commissioner, looking forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Chair Trump. Okay. All right. So now we have been joined as, with this panel, Vincent Sapienza, Michael Deloach, and Joseph uh, Muren. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, counsel to swear you in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Okay. You can start. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Chair Constantinidis, Chair Drum, and members. Uh, I am Vincent Sapienza, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, and at the table with me is our Chief Financial Officer, Joe Muren, and Deputy Commissioner Michael Deloach. And we have our senior uh, DEP leadership here in the front row with us. Uh, just to start off, Chair Constantinidis, we look forward to continuing to work with you on our shared priorities of sustainability, resiliency, environmental justice, and continuing to improve the environment for all New Yorkers. Chair Drum, congratulations on your new role as finance chair, uh, and to committee members Adams, Powers, and Moya, and for Council Member Moya, we have a couple thousand of your constituents at our main building at Lefrak City, so. 
Uh, we look forward to um, continuing to highlight the great work that our agency does and uh, being responsive to your questions, as I think we have been in the past. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Just as background, DEP has the overall responsibility for the city's water supply and sewer system, including providing drinking water for all New Yorkers, managing stormwater, and collecting and treating wastewater. In addition, DEP regulates air quality, hazardous waste, and critical quality of life issues, including noise. All of our water-related expenditures, both operational and capital, are funded with the money collected from over 834,000 property owners who pay a water bill. I will stop by providing an update on this year's water rate setting process. As background, the New York City Water Board is an independent body whose fiduciary mandate under state law is to set rates that will satisfy system revenue requirements for operations and maintenance expenses, for servicing debt obligations, and for achieving fiscally prudent year-end cash reserves. The board and DEP are assisted by an independent rate consultant in analyzing the fiscal needs of the system and developing water rate scenarios. On April 27th, DEP proposed to the Water Board a 2.36% rate increase for fiscal year 2019. We have been able to contain rate increases over the past few years, primarily due to Mayor de Blasio's historic decision to eliminate the annual rental payment from the water system to the city treasury. DEP's balance sheet has also remained steady in recent years due to favorable market conditions, including low borrowing costs and robust local employment, enabling most homeowners to pay their water bills on time. Given future uncertainties, DEP continues to make operational improvements and quantitatively assess capital needs to keep rates affordable going forward. This year's rate proposal includes the extension of several affordability programs expected to benefit as many as 65,000 low-income senior and disabled property owners. Uh, it would also provide a $250 credit to 40,000 affordable apartment units. In addition, the rate proposal recommends freezing the minimum charge at $1.27 per day for the fifth consecutive year for those who use fewer than 95 gallons per day. As a result, about a quarter of all single-family homeowners, many of whom are seniors, will see no rate increase at all. The Water Board will hold public hearings in every borough, starting with Brooklyn on May 21st, to hear directly from the public. And your staffs have been uh, given the full schedule, and postings have appeared in both the Daily News and the New York Post. Uh, so now I'll talk about the FY19 Executive Four-Year Capital Plan. Uh, so for DEP, the plan is $12.1 billion for fiscal 19 through 22, uh, as was presented by Mayor de Blasio on April 26th. This funding supports critical investments in the city's drinking water supply system, the sewer network, and wastewater treatment plants. It also provides funding for a number of initiatives to promote the overall health of New York City's environment. New York City's water supply system provides 1 billion gallons of safe drinking water daily to more than 9 million people. This includes residents of New York City, millions of tourists and commuters who visit the city throughout the year, and approximately 1 million people living in the counties of Westchester, Putnam, Orange, and Ulster. In all, the system provides nearly half of the population of New York State with drinking water. Over the next four years, DEP will invest $2.7 billion to protect the quality of our reservoirs and the integrity of our dams, provide for treatment where necessary, and maintain and repair the pipes that convey drinking water to all New Yorkers. In December 2017, DEP received a new 10-year Filtration Avoidance Determination, or FAD, from the New York State Department of Health. The FAD recognizes the great work the DEP has done to protect the reservoirs in the Catskill and Delaware watersheds, including the acquisition of tens of thousands of acres of land, governing certain activities in the watershed, and partnering with many upstate communities to reduce sources of pollution. The four-year plan includes $341 million for FAD programs, of which $129 million is allocated for land acquisition. The nationally recognized FAD program helps us to avoid building a very costly drinking water filtration plant, by some estimates more than $10 billion. The Delaware Aqueduct conveys more than half of New York City's high-quality drinking water every day from reservoirs in the Catskill Mountains. DEP is currently implementing a $1.5 billion program to repair a leak in a section of the aqueduct 
that is 800 feet below the surface of the Hudson River. Although this project extends even beyond the four-year plan, the executive budget provides $253 million for projects associated with its repair related to water conservation and to provide supplemental sources of water during the Delaware Aqueduct shutdown in late 2022. The most significant of these associated projects will increase the capacity of the Catskill Aqueduct by an additional 50 million gallons per day, and this project accounts for nearly $200 million of the above total. The capital plan includes $600 million to complete the Brooklyn Queens leg of city water tunnel number three, which includes funding to construct two new shafts in Queens. In 1970, the city began construction of city water tunnel number three, and it is one of the largest and longest running public works projects in the city's history. In 2013, DEP activated the Manhattan portion of the tunnel and laid the groundwork to get water flowing further down the tunnel. Late this year, DEP ensured that the Brooklyn Queens leg was activation ready so that in the unlikely event of a major failure of city water tunnels number one or two prior to the completion of the two shafts, DEP could quickly deliver water through the entire distribution area of city water tunnel number three. DEP is responsible for the maintenance of more than 7,500 miles of sewers throughout the city. Over the last several years, DEP has embraced a data-driven, proactive approach to operating and maintaining this sewer system. By using a range of digital tools and innovative practices, DEP developed targeted programs to provide a high level of service to our customers while focusing on investments that prioritize resources. Over the past decade, these programs have significantly driven down confirmed sewer backups. Since 2013, we have been more act proactively cleaning sewers rather than the previous practice of reactively cleaning them after a backup occurred. In 2017, DEP proactively cleaned more than 400 miles of sewers, more than a mile a day. The executive FY19 to 22 capital plan projects $2.7 billion of spending on sewers, including uh, $1.0 billion for replacement of sewers, storm sanitary and combined, and $1.5 billion for new sewers, including high-level storm sewers. The Staten Island Blue Belts are an award-winning, ecologically sound and cost-effective stormwater management system for approximately one-third of Staten Island's land area. The program preserves natural drainage corridors called blue belts, including streams, ponds, and other wetland areas. They provide important community open spaces and diverse wildlife basins. This budget includes more than $270 million in funding, including extending blue belts into other boroughs for Springfield Lake, Van Cortlandt Park, the New York Botanical Gardens, and additional locations across the city. Alleviating street flooding in Southeast Queens is a major priority for Major de Blasio and DEP. The mayor has committed to substantially accelerate relief in Southeast Queens by pairing traditional sewer construction with green infrastructure throughout the region. Through FY17, DEP had committed $227 million for this work. Uh, in FY18, uh, we anticipate committing an additional $186 million. This four-year plan has another one, uh, $911 million funded in FY19 through 22. DEP manages an average of 1.2 billion gallons of wastewater that New Yorkers generate each day through 14 wastewater treatment facilities. In alignment with wastewater utilities across the country, DEP is embracing best management practices to ensure a sustainable future that minimizes waste, maximizes resources, protects our ratepayers, improves the community, and embraces innovation. Wastewater resource recovery is an essential element in delivering maximum environmental benefits at the least cost to society. DEP is working to promote our role in energy optimization, greenhouse gas reduction, carbon sequestration, and operational improvements to efficiently manage the expense budget while expanding environmental opportunities. The four-year plan includes $4.5 billion in wastewater treatment projects, $2.9 billion of which is for the reconstruction or replacement of components at our wastewater treatment plants and pumping stations. DEP is constructing a new cogeneration system at the North River plant, which will use renewable digester gas produced during the wastewater treatment process to power equipment and heat the facility. This project, totaling $261 million, 
will help us reduce our energy use in line with the mayor's major commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. The remaining $1.6 billion of investment will be used to continue mitigating combined sewer overflows that occur during storms. I am proud to report that our harbor waters are cleaner and healthier than they've been in more than a century. Key indicators of water quality include concentrations of bacteria and nitrogen that continue to drop, while dissolved oxygen is on the rise. We are hearing more and more reports of whales, dolphins, and seals returning to our waterways, and we are proud to see those efforts paying off. In 2012, the state and city signed a groundbreaking agreement to further reduce CSOs using a hybrid gray and green infrastructure approach. So far, the state has approved eight of the city's plans, and one additional plan is under review. The plans for Flushing Bay and Newtown Creek call for enormous CSO storage tunnels beneath Brooklyn and Queens to significantly reduce overflows. DEP is currently developing plans for Jamaica Bay and the East River and open waters. The budget includes $676 million for green infrastructure, such as rain gardens and infiltration beds, and $931 million for gray infrastructure, such as giant underground tanks and tunnels to store wastewater. Included in the budget are projects to improve water quality in the Bronx River, Alley Creek, the Hutchinson River, and Flushing Creek. The plan also includes $535 million for the federally mandated construction of two storage tanks to reduce overflows into the Gowanus Canal. We are hopeful that we can purchase uh, these two sites without involving eminent domain. Uh, now I'm going to go into the FY19 expense budget. The projected DEP expense budget for the current fiscal year, FY18, uh, will be $1.48 billion. This includes approximately $210 million in Community Development Block Grant, CDBG funds, for which DEP serves as the contracting entity for the city. For FY19, we expect DEP's expense budget to be $1.39 billion, including $92 million in CDBG funding for the Build It Back program. The preliminary FY19 expense budget breaks down into the following large categories. $545 million, or 39% of our total expense budget, is for personal services to pay the salaries of more than 6,000 funded positions. $167 million is for property taxes on upstate watershed lands, a critical investment in maintaining the high quality of New York City's drinking water by protecting it at the source. I am pleased to report that we have successfully negotiated agreements with several upstate municipalities to make our tax obligations more stable and predictable, and in some cases, to reduce them. Uh, we have $96 million for heat, light, and power. DEP is the largest of the third largest municipal consumer of electric power in New York City after the Department of Education and Health and Hospitals. And our consumption will, go, will grow as we bring new mandated treatment facilities online for both drinking water and wastewater. To control energy costs and greenhouse emissions, DEP is investing in projects such as the cogeneration system at the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is now in construction. Chemicals such as chlorine and fluoride that are used in the treatment of drinking water and other chemicals like glycerol and ferric chloride that are used for wastewater treatment account for $51 million. Finally, management of the 1,300 tons per day of biosolids uh, is projected to cost about $56 million in FY19, just over 4% of our projected FY19 expenses. DEP has also taken a hard look at our processes to identify where we can reduce costs without sacrificing quality or reliability. We project reducing our overtime usage by about $1.5 uh, million this year uh, and estimate that procurement reforms will save over $1.2 million. We are working to improve our interactions with our customers with a new, modern customer service information system, which will incorporate best industry practices. We expect to award this contract in the summer, working with our partner agencies to ensure effective implementation. We expect the new system to take two years to design and construct. On behalf of the over 6,000 employees at DEP, uh, across both uh, the city and upstate, I want to again express our appreciation uh, to the Environmental Protection Chair, Constantinides, for his strong leadership and advocacy, and express our continued commitment to collaborating with Chair Drum and all of the council partners to continue delivering on our agency's mission. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have.
Thank you, Commissioner, and I um, appreciate that you're here. Uh, in your testimony, you noted that uh, just this past week, DEP um, proposed a 2.36% increase in the fiscal year 2019 water rate. Um, you know, it comes out to be about for a single family homeowner, homeowner, I think about 217 a month, and for a multifamily unit, it's $1.35 a month. Um, and I guess for some people it's a small amount, but um, the problem is that it keeps going up. And so my question really is, um, um, how do you determine um, how far down the road these increases are going to continue to happen going into the future? So uh, on April 27th, we did um, make a recommendation to the Water Board to increase the rate for the coming year to by 2.36%. Um, and, and we have been looking forward in, in, in the coming years. Um, to, to, to meet the needs of the system, we, we you know, have the fiduciary responsibility to determine what the rate is, but we understand uh, that even, even what some might consider you know, small percentage increases can impact uh, certain homeowners. And so what, we've, what we are continuing to do are those affordability programs that we've successfully done in the past. And some of them I mentioned in my testimony uh, that we, we have an affordability program that will benefit about 65,000 low-income homeowners, primarily uh, seniors and the disabled, and they'll get a $115 bill credit. Uh, we have uh, a program to give credits to, to 40,000 uh, apartment units uh, whose landlords agree to enter into affordability and conservation programs. And I guess the, the, one of the main things, too, is the, the minimum charge for property owners who, who use a low amount of water, less than 95 gallons a day, we, we're freezing their rate at $1.27 a day. So, again, we want to, we want to keep in mind the, 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 the property owners who can least afford the increase, and I think these programs uh, are, are there for them. So I, I have here in front of me that in 2009 there was a 14.5 percent increase, um, and then this year we're at a 2.36 percent or increase going to 2019. What? How do you decide that, and how do you know what you're going to be doing, or how do you predict what you might be doing a little bit further down the road? Yeah. So, so the the water rates that are set. Uh, must provide funding both for the current fiscal year's uh, expense uh, and capital budget. To, to, to fund projects, large capital projects, um, DEP works with the Municipal Water Finance Authority to, to um, sell bonds to investors and we, we collect those revenues and then have to pay them back. So the rate is set to pay back those funds. We, we not only look at the coming fiscal year, but we take a longer term view. We don't like spikes in the rates, some of which happened in the past. Um, because that's, that's the point I'm trying to get at, is how do we avoid those spikes so that we don't have a, a, a year where there's a 14 percent and then it drops? We'd like to drop, but the spike is what is concerning to us. Right. And, and, and uh, Mr. Chair, we, we, we do look at, at least out four years and in some cases longer to just make sure that uh, we're not, we're not going to be jumping up and down. And um, when, when we do sell bonds to investors, the offering statement does have a four-year outlook, and um, it's the, the, the uh, outlook is less is single digits at least through the, the four-year plan. So with, with like something like with the Delaware Aqueduct, let's say, does that factor into your decision making in terms of how you set the rate for this year and then moving forward? That's right. So we'll, we'll look at our four-year capital plan, what the needs are, um, you know, what bond offerings we're going to need to do, how much we're going to have to pay back the, the, the bond holders, and, and that all gets factored in. And we do have a, a, a third-party rate consultant, uh, Amawa Consulting, and they, they help us uh, do, do longer-term outlooks. And with that uh, Delaware water, with that Delaware, uh, not water, Delaware aqueduct um, repair, how are you preparing residents there's going to eventually be a shutdown there, right? Yeah. So we are in construction now. We are building a parallel tunnel 800 feet below uh, Newburgh to bypass the leaking section of the, uh, the old Delaware aqueduct. And when we make the tie-in of that two-and-a-half-mile new tunnel with the old tunnel, there will be a shutdown of about five to eight months in late 2022. So half of New York City's water supply uh, will be shut off at that time. And we're, we've been developed. We've been working with a lot of upstate municipalities who also use that that, that water from the aqueduct. But um, we, we we feel confident that with our two other sources, the Catskill system and the Croton system, we will have sufficient supply. But we do want to still 
communicate that to our residents uh, d during the, the 20 So what are the year? plans to get that out to residents? I remember Mayor Koch deputizing students to be water watch guards or uh, sheriffs or something uh, to get parents, you know, to flush less often and turn off taps and do you have any plan like that? Yeah, we rem I remember that too, and we are, we are starting to put that together. So we've got you know a couple of years, but uh, I, I, again, we, we we are comfortable and confident that we have a su su sufficient water supply during that period. But conservation uh, is always something we prefer. So you're going to be developing a plan a little bit further down the road. Do you have a, a projected a projected date for that plan? We do. We 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 expect in 2020 to have the plan uh, out, but. Um, We've already been doing things ahead of time, and we've been working with um, DOE and HHC. We've been providing them funding to, to replace some of their high-flow fixtures as well. So what's the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what's the current consumption rate, and what do you plan or think that it will be when, when that work yeah. starts? And that's a great question and a, and a great story, because if you go back uh, you know, a generation ago, in New York City, we were using about 1.5 billion gallons a day of, of water, and we're down this last year in 2017 for the first time below a billion gallons, did 990 million gallons. And there's several reasons for that is you know, all the water conservation initiatives and low flow fixtures and appliances. And now 97% of, of property owners pay a water bill based upon how much they actually use, so they're more conscious of, of that. But um, we're, we're under a billion gallons now. We expect to be about a billion about gallons a day going uh, forward. So. Um, the, the two systems, the Catskill and the Croton, can meet that, that need. Did you say what um, uh, contributes to the drop in the consumption? So, so a few things. Um, low flow fixtures and appliances now, low flow toilets, dishwashers, washing machines. Um, but we think a lot of it is people are now, instead of paying on an old frontage charge where you played, paid one flat water bill per year, you're actually paying now on a meter grade. And so I think a lot of people are more conscious about how much they're using. Okay. Um, you know, I was the former chair of the Education Committee before I became chair of this committee. And, um, you know, the environmental internship project that you have looks like it's great. Uh, my question is that um, it's, it seems to be only an Ulster County Community College. How do we get that down here? So, yeah, so uh, the, the internship program we've been doing for many years at DEP, it's, it really is a terrific program. Um, you know, we need a lot of different skill sets at DEP. We have an aging workforce, and so we want to encourage uh, young folks to get familiar with us and we, we, we with them. So uh, we have our internships upstate and in-city. I think it's 112, I think we have. Yes. I think we've signed up 112 uh, students this summer. You have the number, Joe? Yes. 112. Are they upstate or here? Yeah, no, both. these yeah. are both. Both, and so where are they here? So for, for uh, the city, they, they would come out of our uh, office in Queens, uh, but they could be uh, stationed at any of our wastewater treatment plants or out on waterways taking samples. Uh, or so, but it's, it runs through Ulster? No, no, no. So, we, so there, there are some programs that are done in the city, and then some of, for some of our watershed uh, internships that, that are up at the reservoirs in Ulster County, but different, different sets of kids. Uh, okay, I see. Um, all right, let me go to another one that I get a huge number of complaints in my office about, which is noise reporting, which is why I was cheering before. Um, with the number of noise pollution complaints hovering around 50,000 to 60,000 per year, and the average time to close a complaint of uh, 5.2 days, I, as I said, I'm glad to see the funding in the executive plan to hire 19 full-time staff for a rapid noise response unit. So I just want to really know a little bit more how that's going to work. How did the agency and OMB determine that 19 would be an adequate number for this unit? So you, you're right about noise complaints, and you know as the economy has improved over the years, we're, we're seeing a lot more construction and, and after hours construction. We've been getting a lot of complaints. So um, a couple of things: we we looked at what what the need would be to more quickly respond to complaints. Um, but in the context of uh, Local Law 53, which was just signed this this past January. Um, that that uh, gives us the, the the flexibility and the ability to, uh, I just think, more better enforce um, against some types of businesses like construction. Um, 
businesses. In, in the past, the, the, the noise code required our inspectors to actually go to the complainant's premises to take a noise reading, mm -hmm. and that was often tough. You'd have to make an appointment, and some, some people just didn't want us in their apartments. Under Local Law 53, we're now able to just go to the site and from the street level take a reading and issue a violation uh, based upon that. So that's going to make us more effective, and with the 19 new heads, we could certainly And just it. how did you get to that 19 again? So we, we did an assessment about how many okay. existing staff we had and what percentage increase we would need uh, to, to, to respond to, again, the, the, the uptick in, in complaints. And how will they be dispersed amongst the boroughs? And so that they come out of our office in Queens um, and they respond wherever there are complaints throughout the city. But they'll be operating out of the, out of the Junction Boulevard? Yeah, so at the beginning of the day, they, they'll, they'll report to the office, they'll pick up their equipment, and then they'll head out. Yeah, we also, by, by the way, with the, with the 19 new employees, several of them will be on, on an evening shift, uh, you know, working from, from like 4 p.m. to midnight or 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., which is because one of the Because oftentimes what happens is that the, 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 the problem ends before the response team can get there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so will you be working with other agencies? One of the things I was told was that I think the NYPD had four, four noise meters or whatever they're called, and um, oftentimes they were not able to get readings or whatever. Are you, are you working, are these, are these response teams going to be in addition to what NYPD is doing? And yeah. is, is it the same type of uh, situation? Yeah, they're in addition, but, but we work closely with NYPD and with the Department of Buildings, because again, a lot of the complaints are, are construction related, but um, we, we often will, will go out together as, as teams to do those inspections. Uh, NYPD primarily responds to noise complaints uh, after hours clubs or at house parties. Uh, the DEP's inspectional force, we're, we're not peace officers, so where we think there may be a situation that's a little bit dicey, uh, NYPD will, will respond to those. We'll go with you. So um, do you have any estimates on the, on the response times and what criteria would, would call for the response team to react, to respond to it? Yeah, and, and that's, you know, another thing we're, we're doing, Mr. Chair, is uh, as 311 calls come in, instead of looking at them individually, we actually have, we call it a heat map now, and they'll come up on the screen, and if we see a particular area is getting a lot of complaints, you know, maybe there's one particular construction site that a lot of people are complaining about, those are the ones we more rapidly respond to. Uh, what's the allowable decibel level? So, so it varies. Uh, it, it previously had been 85 uh, decibels under the new local law. It's actually being ratcheted down from, from that to 80 and then to 75. Um, but that's on construction noise. For other things, like if there's an equipment that may be running 24 hours a day, say ventilation equipment on a building, there are other, other decibel levels. So um, one thing that's a pet peeve of mine are the leaf blowers. If people were to make a complaint about leaf blowers, would your resp rapid response team be able to go out and check uh, that out? Yeah, I, I, if we can get there in time, I guess. Uh, but, but those are kind of more transient uh, noise complaints that we haven't in the past responded to. Um, I actually have some legislation on that, and um, I should talk to the Chair Constantinidis about that as well. Um, uh, on another issue, I just have a couple more questions. On a citywide basis, approximately how many properties have water main line connection? A private water main. I have an issue, yeah. and I'm going to take a little bit of chair privilege on this one. I have an issue with a private property owner who had the water main line installed prior to records being kept or whatever. So um, if a homeowner has a private water main line, what, if any, options are available for that property owner with respect to opting into the public system? So, so Mr. Chair, there are a handful of locations throughout the city that um, are, are on unmapped streets. They're, they're, they're not in the, um, I guess, the borough president's official directory of streets, and, and this, the water mains that were laid there in some cases 100 years ago are not city-owned, they're privately owned, and uh, as those age out, we, we know that from time to time there has been problems where homeowners just have, have, a, have a failing line. Uh, we've been trying to, to figure that out, maybe getting some streets officially mapped so that the city would be allowed to put in, you know, New York City infrastructure there, but uh, that's been coming up more and more over the last couple of years. It's more and more, so it's even further than just my district. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue to work on that. I know that my staff has been in communication with you on that as well, but um, it, it continues to be a growing problem. 
in one particular area of my district, which actually is South Elmhurst, and then another issue there, which is similar, though, to some other residents in Queens. So um, some of the residents in Southeast Queens are close to an underground portion of Newtown Creek and are concerned that the water table is causing sinkhole conditions. Currently, DEP is conducting a groundwater study, which includes Southeast Queens and the underlying area. Is DEP amenable to studying other areas, such as this area in South uh, Elmhurst? So just for Southeast Queens, we had been getting a number of complaints from, from homeowners who were saying that the groundwater table, as it's been rising, um, they're, they're actually seeing some groundwater in their basement. So that's the, the purpose why we did the study in, in Southeast Queens, to see what we could do there. Um, but, you know, over the years, as there's been less and less pumping of groundwater for drinking water or industrial uses, uh, we have been seeing the, the groundwater rise in certain areas. and. You know, we're, we're certainly amenable to assessing where, where there may be needs elsewhere. So, so in, in relation to um, building out water supply lines in, in Queens, would this have any impact on sinkhole conditions uh, in the area? Yeah, so, so sinkholes can, can, you know, occur for a variety of reasons. Some of them are water related, you know, for water main breaks, you know, you certainly get a sinkhole. Um, you know, we, we seen in the past, you know, where there were historic stream beds that got filled in by real estate developers. That we get sinkholes from time to time. But, yeah, if there's a particular area, Mr. Chair, you want us to look at, we can certainly get out there. Okay. South Elmhurst, I'll get you the, the okay. area, too. All right. Now, we've been joined by Council Members uh, Cumbo, Majority Leader Cumbo, Council Member Yeager, Council Member Menchaca, Council Member Van Bramer, and Council Member Traeger. And I want to turn it over to our Chair to ask uh, questions, and then we'll go to questions from members as well. Commissioner, thank you for your testimony. Um, we've done a lot of really good work together, um, so I definitely appreciate that. Uh, so I really want to kind of drill down on the budget response uh, from the council. Uh, you know, we, improve, we included several recommendations for the Department of DEP, uh, recommendations that called upon the administration to include uh, $400 million in relation to Soundview houses and Blend houses, uh, the waterways around there for additional CSO uh, uh, remediation. Uh, $108 million was put into the budget for new sewer build-out, uh, which isn't quite the same thing, and I'm not sure where it, that $108 billion million is going to go. So can you sort of explain to me why, one, uh, the council budget request uh, was not considered in the exec budget, and then secondly, what is this $108 million uh, going to get us uh, when it comes to sewer build-out? Where would it be? What will help us capture? What, what's happening with that $108 million? Yeah, no, again, thank you, for, for Mr. Chair, for your continued advocacy on, on, on a bunch of uh, initiatives that we've been doing, and um, we have submitted plans to, to DEC, many of which have, are, have been approved uh, to, to further reduce combined sewer overflows. Um, you know, but, but, but in the end, it's, it's a balance of, you know, trying to leverage the, the, the right projects uh, with, with an, an amount of spending that just keeps water and sewer rates, uh, you know, somewhat in check. And, you know, we've got, uh, you know, the, our board behind us, which kind of talks about where, where funding is going. And, you know, it's always a, a, an, an issue of if you, you, you add to, to one other area, if, you know, certain people uh, advocate for, for more combined sewer overflows, is do we, do we have to reduce funding somewhere else without expanding, uh, you know, the need from, from homeowners to pay a bigger bill? So where is that $108 million? Yeah. Uh, you, you included additional yeah. spending of $108 million. So there is money. We found yeah. it. So what is that $108 million yeah. going to buy us? Ahead, um, Can you state your name for the record? Uh, yes, certainly, Mr. Chair. Joseph Murin. I'm Chief Financial Officer. Yes. So that $108 million was an additional um, to sewer emergency work. As you know, we have uh, you know, a variety of uh, budget lines that cover of work that happens on, you know, an on-planned um, on basis, such as sewer emergency. So that 
was underfunded, and we worked with OMB to go and see that there was additional funding. But what sort there. of projects? Were so that would happen in an you know, instance where if you have a, a, a sewer cave-in, um, a sinkhole condition, as the, the chair also said, mm -hmm. so that those are, you know, where they're not specifically allocated because you can't predict when they're going to know when they're going to happen where, but you do know that you're going to have a certain level where we generally spend about. I'd say a hundred million a year or so. I'm looking to uh, acting deputy commissioner. Uh, so that wasn't in there. So that 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 it that was sort of, we that had, sort of we parachute had, wasn't in the budget before. We had um, baseline. We had some baseline funding there, but it was not sufficient in what we were looking mm -hmm. forward to. So this was to incrementally add funding for that. So we're not sure where it's going to go, but we know we need 108 million dollars yes, more of it. Yes, exactly. All right. I mean, I, I still feel strongly, and you're going to hear me say this. I, I we're going to keep going back and forth, but I really believe that. Uh, a good investment for the New York City, uh, for New York City in general, is to deal with our CSO issues. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's an environmental justice issue, it's a quality of life issue. It, I understand we have certain agreements uh, with the DEC, um, but when just, you know, so let's look, take a quick dive before I go into sure. too, too much down a hole. Uh, the council called to evaluate utilizing ultraviolet filtration um, rather than chlorination on certain sites. And, you know, we are not 100 percent sure that chlorination is the right way to go. And I said this at the last hearing, but we're, we're sending the chlorination in to kill the bacteria from the sewage. And then we're putting something else in to kill the chlorination. And it kind of feels like the story I used to tell my son about the old lady who swallowed a fly. You know, at the end she died because she swallowed a horse, of course. Like, you know, this is, this is where we're going here uh, on the chlorination issue. So why is an ultraviolet filtration the better way to go. Yeah, and, and Councilor, we, we, you know, going back a few years, looked re really hard at different types of disinfection for these overflows. Um, and, and the issue we found with UV, th th there's a couple of things. One is that um, UV works by just really zapping bugs with, with ultraviolet light and, and, and either killing them or damaging their DNA so that they can't reproduce. But UV doesn't work particularly well when you have turbid water. It, it, UV is great and we use it upstate in our drinking water supply. We have clear water. The murkier water in CSOs, um, it, it, you need a lot of a lot of power from the UV lights. It's tr a transmissivity issue to, to do it. And then we said, well, if you're going to go in that direction and have to use a lot of energy, it's number one going to cost you more for electric power. But to generate that power, there's going to be a greenhouse emission somewhere. So are we you know, trying to solve one problem of harbor water quality and then have a, you know, a, a, a greenhouse gas uh, climate change issue. So that's why we, we, we pivoted to the chlorine and, um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're still working with the Department of, Envir uh, Department of Environmental Conservation at the state uh, to determine the best way to do that. Now, I see that there is an additional nine, uh, $90 million for the design and construction of Flushing Bay abatement facilities. Um, what does that do to help uh, reduce the overflow in that water body. Yeah, so one of the, the, the biggest uh, CSO overflow uh, goes into uh, Flushing Creek and Flushing Bay. Um, we've already built a, a facility at Flushing Creek that, that stores about 40 million gallons of, of uh, stormwater, but um, just going forward, we are, we have submitted a plan to, to the state to build a large storage tunnel um, that, that will is that the tunnel that we've talked about that goes from Flushing Bay all the way into Astoria to Bowery Bay? That's right. So that, that tunnel will do the same as the, the storage tank that's at Flushing Creek. It'll store what would have otherwise been an overflow until the rain event ends, and then it can be pumped to the Bowery Bay treatment plant. So that $90 million helps us get on the road to get that tunnel done. That's right. And what's the um, sort of due date for that particular project? Yeah, so, so the $90 million gets the design going, and then okay. the, ultimately the project, we think it's probably a bit over a billion dollars, and, and once the design is done, yeah, it's late 2020s. So, I mean, I, I, really just, I really believe that, you know, the, the LT and you know, the long-term control plan should be a floor, uh, not our ceiling. So I, I look forward to working with you to getting more of that done. I have three more questions, Chair Drum. Um, so abandoned boats. Uh, we heard about this in our hearing on Jamaica Bay uh, a few, few months, about a few weeks ago. Uh, with respect to derelict boats and local water bodies, how much funding is included in the 2019 fiscal budget uh, for their removal? 
So we, we, we don't have direct funding. We, we have some uh, environmental benefits money with the Department of Environmental Conservation, and, and we've been using that to do cleanups in certain areas, particularly wherever floatable debris watch, washes up on shorelines, but we have removed some vessels uh, that way. The Department of Parks has their own contract to remove uh, debris, including vessels, and we've, we've helped supplement that as well. Uh, but, you know, going forward, we, we want to look at, at other means. It's, it's probably one the, the number one complaint about uh, shoreline debris. And, and do you think that, you know, we have the resources to monitor the water bodies? Because I've heard stories of people scraping um, the numbers off the boats, and that's basically leaving them in local water bodies, and then that creates safety issues and environmental issues for those water bodies. Yeah, that's the discussion we've been having with some of the, the, the folks who, who are on Jamaica Bay and in Coney Island Creek, is that they're just truly truly meant to be abandoned and people are you know instead of do we have a do we have a program through the city that we that someone can take a boat um to, if they don't want it any longer to to get it properly disposed of i, I don't know no we'll, we'll check on that okay uh, let me just quickly transition over to biosolids um so in march of this year a train full of biosolids was sent from new york city to alabama for disposal and was held up because of concerns raised by the local community. Currently, the city relies heavily on other communities to take on this bio-waste, approximately 1,300 tons per day to dispose of it. I know the Department of Sanitation has a long-term export plan for refused disposal. Um, does DEP have such a plan for biosolids? Yes, so Mr. Chair, um, just what biosolids are. So dirty wastewater comes into a wastewater treatment plant, Clean water goes out the other end, and the muck that's removed, the organics, is, is biosolids. And, yeah, I, um, didn't eat, I didn't eat brownies. For, after yeah. I saw the cake, I didn't eat brownies for like two months. Yeah, <laughs> if you heard that. <laughs> so we used to take that material for, for 100 years, and it was dumped in the ocean. But uh, Congress in the 1990s passed the Ocean Dumping Ban Act, and we have, to, we have to now land apply it. So most of it goes to landfill. Some of it goes for mine reclamation. But um, we have looked for where the lowest cost landfills are throughout the country because we want to try to keep our water rates low and one of them was in Alabama and the as was called the poop train uh, was stuck on a railroad siding for a while um, but we've we've since corrected that but longer term we're looking at, at a bunch of things one of them is just trying to make that that cake a little bit drier reduce the volume and then that will have there'll be less of it to to ultimately dispose of but um, the biosolids do have a nutrient value as well, and, and some municipalities use it as a fertilizer, uh, you know, soil amendments, and those are some of the things we want to look at going so forward. So we can find beneficial reuse ways so it, we can actually, even not make money, but at least not spend money to get rid of these biosolids, right? Because we're that, spending quite a bit of money to get rid the of plan. them. That's the plan, and our deputy commissioner for wastewater treatment, Pam Milardo, who's here, is putting uh, that plan together. I, I love Pam. I still didn't eat the cake for, I did, couldn't eat brownies <laughs> for like two months after that. Sorry, Pam. <laughs> but the last thing I'll say on, on the bio what happens if a community doesn't want it? Does it get dumped there? I mean, how do we make sure that we're not leaving our waste in environmental justice communities throughout the country? Like, is there a way to make sure that we work with individuals and work with companies that aren't just going to dump it? Yeah, I think we, we can do it. Certainly a better job of that, uh, Mr. Chair, is, is again, you know, we, we generally look for the price first on landfills, but, you know, we certainly send staff down to, to those communities just to make sure that, uh, you know, it, we, we find places that, that aren't, uh, you know, impacting environmental justice communities uh, particularly. But, you know, it is getting tougher and tougher to find locations to dispose of those materials, and which is why we want to look for more beneficial uses. All right, I'm going to uh, stop questioning now. I wanna, if the chair will indulge me, I'll come back for a second round. Absolutely. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Espinal, and we're going to start off with questions from Councilmember Grudenchik, followed by Adams, Richards, and Traeger. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum and Chair Costantanidis. Um, question. I know that the water uh, consumption in the city of New York has dropped rapidly. Have we seen any increases due to urban farming? You, uh, I know that more and more we're growing food in New York City, which was something that would not be conceivable a generation ago, but um, I have a big farm in my district. I assume they use well water, but and there is a lot of water available in parts of my district in southeast Queens, but yeah. 
any impact at all? Do no, and that's a great question because I know we, we've been seeing really an explosion in urban farming, and I, I don't think we've, we've done a deep dive on, on how much water is being used. Do they use, I guess they're using well water. I mean, they may be using. They got to be using water. something. If they're using city water, you know, they certainly would have a meter that we could take a look at. Um, so that's a good, good question. I'm just curious about that because, um, you know, agriculture uses an incredible amount of water, which is fine if you have it. But in New York City, it's it's probably prohibitively expensive. I wanted to get back also to the chlorination issue because that um, one of the CSOs is. Uh, Oakland Lake and then into uh, the alley. And is it possible, I, I understand your concern about um, using energy and that, is it possible to, you know, build uh, solar facilities over there or, you know, using the latest technology? There, there, are, there is open space over there. Um, we may be able to put solar stuff, not my district, so we'd have to talk to Paul Vallone, but uh, it's just something that uh, concerns me that, you know, we worked so hard for so many years to clean up the alley. and it's doing better. Um, wildlife is definitely returning there. So I hope you will keep us up to date on uh, DEP's efforts in that regard. We will. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairs. Thank you. Okay, now we're, uh, for, uh, questions from Councilmember Adams. Thank you very much to both chairs. Uh, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I want to give a shout out to our Queens representative, Karen Ellis. Woo -woo. Um, we're really, really pleased with her. She does great work with us. Um, I've seen in a few schools in my district uh, something that's very, very wonderful for the children, and that's the use of the bottle fillers in the schools. So my question really is a practical one. For fiscal year 2019, does the department have plans to install additional bottle fillers and water fountains in parks and schools? I don't have the specific numbers, but I do know that we have an ongoing program where we have funding allocated. I'll, I can follow up with specifics, but yes, we do have plans to be installing them in more locations. It's an ongoing yearly project. Um, the staffer who was running it for us recently left, but I'll, I'll get the information and let you know. Okay, and that would include, um, for my edification, any specific targeted areas? Sure. Happy okay. to get you that information. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Councilmember Richards. Followed by Traeger. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, and Mike, and Karen, and everyone who's done some great work uh, in Southeast Queens and citywide as well. Um, question just on, uh, so how much money did we spend last fiscal year uh, compared to what you're anticipating to spend this uh, specific year uh, in the Southeast Queens plan? Well, he finds the answer. I guess I can move on. Yeah, we're, we're okay. I'll remember, but we, I believe we're on target for 187 million, was it, as a, uh, the commissioner said in this testimony? And I think year to date, hold on, let me see if I have a Southeast Queens tab here. Here we go. Yes, 910 million overall in the plan. Yes, of which uh, I believe it's 200. Yes, it was 227 through 17, okay. uh, fiscal year 17. There's anticipated that we'll commit $186 million this year. That's mm -hmm. not set in stone yet, but if it doesn't commit this year, those funds will roll over into the next fiscal year. And that means those projects are in process. So they, would, if they don't register for mm -hmm. 18, they'll get registered in early 19. And then, you know, as noted, we've got another a billion dollars for the four years from 19 through 22. And are you confident you're going to get how much, how much of the plan do you, are you confident? I mean, we aim for 100 percent. We'd all like to get 100 percent commitment rate. I believe last year we were just shy of 80 percent um, for the, the entirety of the agency. Uh, I think we've been very, you know, successful in keeping close to that number on the Southeast Queens projects as well. So yeah. we'll probably look to be, and I'd say to be, uh, you know, conservative in the 70 to 90 percent range yeah. as to the commitments. But, but I do want to add, we've been working closely with the Department of Design and Construction, yep, yep, yep. and they've been doing a lot more upfront up planning, they call it, for, for the Southeast Queens work, and I, I think they've been really, the last couple of years, delivering yeah. pre pretty close to commitment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, in, in terms of green infrastructure, um, 
just want to hear a little bit more about how we're connecting the local community to the job opportunities, or can you just go through the dynamics of, or if we're not, how could we ensure that we, you know, create opportunities for uh, the local community to get into this? So, so one of the ways to uh, reduce the amount of stormwater runoff that's getting into the sewer system is installing green infrastructure and bioswales, curbside rain gardens. We've got 4,000 in the ground already. Uh, we have funding in the budget to, to, to get up to 10,000. Um, they, they work great, but they require a lot of maintenance mm -hmm. to, you know, and, and, and upkeep, uh, everything from you know, re replacing plantings to um, re removing trash and and so we've been hiring and, and we have plans to hire more um, it's it's you know I don't want to say entry level but but low skill set uh, employees who um, the thought is you know hire them get them trained and let them work their way up the uh, the, the trades in, in the agency yeah we've been doing a lot in terms of going out to different uh, colleges and and community college to educate people about opportunities and how they apply and sort of walk them through the process so that's been generating a lot more if you could work with local. all three council members from the local area so we can actually come up with sure. a more targeted plan for the local community that would be appreciated last sure. question i promise chairs um um nitra boilers are you guys in any way involved in that conversation or no? just, just permitting so um when when they go in we, we look at what the emissions uh, on, on the new board but we try to so you're not taking any an other. immediate turnaround that, that that's our only input okay Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Traeger, followed by Levin and Ulrich. Okay. okay. Councilmember Levin. Wait. I'm sorry. Yeah, Traeger. Oh, sorry. Okay. You're up. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. And I just want to give a very quick shout out first uh, to Mario Bruno, who is very, very responsive to my office whenever I email him frequently, but he does get back to me, and I, I do appreciate that, Commissioner. Commissioner, I, it's my understanding that in the executive um, plan, uh, there is $792,000 to improve water quality in and around Coney Island Creek. Can you elaborate on that, and what, is, what does the community engagement plan look like? Because there historically has been a lack of a community uh, engagement with regards to illegal dumping that's incurred there through illegal sewage outfalls. So if you can elaborate on this funding and how will we better engage the community moving forward? Yeah, council member, um, at Coney Island Creek, we've had, you know, certainly issues over the years. Um, we, we know that there are some, they're, they're not public beaches, but, but, but they're used by uh, many folks who, who live nearby and um, there have been, you know, some what we call illegal connections. It's just basically property owners who hook up their uh, sanitary sewage lines, the storm lines, and, and that's, that's been impacting. But, uh, it, it, you know, we have funding through, through uh, the Environmental Benefit Program to help just really do debris cleanup and, and, and track down and try to reduce those overflows. So I'd like to get more information from your office about that. Uh, I, I would like a kind of a breakdown and also just to kind of notify the local community board about that because it, I don't know if you're aware, Commissioner, that uh, uh, DEC leveled a $400,000 penalty against Beach Haven Apartments for dumping raw sewage into the creek. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, activity and try to address that. So I, I would like to find out more information about how we're gonna spend this money to really improve the quality yeah. in around the creek. Um, my second question is with regards to the sewer system in the west end of Coney Island. I'm talking about the area, specifically uh, Neptune Avenue by West 35th Street, 33rd Street. Just to let you know, when it rains, schools suffer because Neptune Avenue turns into Neptune River. It, it's not ponding, it's a river. I have video, I'm sure Mario Bruno uh, has a couple of clips, uh, where a river effect actually occurred and kids can't go to school, staff can't get into the school, the water goes up to the steps of the door. Um, we have a serious problem. And so are you aware of this and what is being done, what's, what's causing it and what's being done to address it? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I am aware, we've had discussions. Uh, I don't have the latest where we are, but um, I don't know, Mario, or we can get back to you if no one's got that information. Yeah, I just want to flag this. This is not your average street flooding. This is, it was a river. 
Uh, I, I will ha I'd be happy to get your email. I could show you the video. It was a river down Neptune Avenue, and it affected schools had to uh, really kind of close early. Uh, it affected attendance. Um, this, this can happen in every rainstorm, and, and this was not a major hurricane. This was just a rainstorm, and so I would like to follow up with you, Commissioner. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just want to ask a little bit, and this might have been asked before, uh, we've been going through the process of uh, CSO tank siting at Gowanus, and obviously this is a very large capital outlay um, on the part of DEP, was not DEP's idea in the first place, uh, this was a mandate from the EPA as part of the uh, Gowanus Superfund. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could talk us through a little bit of how the costs were arrived at, um, because obviously between the, this is the 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 one on the northern end is uh, roughly five hundred million dollars, and another five hundred million dollars uh, for the Owl Creek um, uh, retention tanks. These are large, large cat bottles. Can you take us a little bit through how the the dollar amounts were arrived at, and whether there can be any savings along the way? Yeah. So. So originally when um, EPA came out with their record of decision, I guess about seven or eight years ago, they, they really looked at a simplistic system to store uh, CSOs and they looked at building it in uh, city-owned property under Thomas Green Park. Right. Um, and that's why they came up with such a low estimate. Um, when, when we look at building real CSO retention systems, we look at doing screening and odor control and you know, just making sure that it's a complete system to deal with what can be found in wastewater, and we've done it at our other facilities. So that, that costs more. And then doing property acquisition so that we didn't, didn't have to build a tank in Thomas Green Park. Uh, we, we've, we've pivoted now to private properties, and we're negotiating um, with, with those property owners. That, that's adding to, to the total as well. But you know, I think everyone agrees that the original estimate by EPA was just really low. Right, right. Um, are there any ideas of like how you could reduce costs uh, over time or along the way, or is, uh, is, is are a lot of these fixed costs you think uh, within the capital control? Yeah, I, I, I think and and lesson learned from the past is by building it right and, and doing it well now and spending the capital money up front, it's going to reduce the ongoing expenses. You know, the forever O and M going forward, and mm -hmm. um, I think that that's how we really help to reduce costs. Um, uh, and then uh, last question, up in the other part of the district I represent in Greenpoint, um, at a community meeting a couple, uh, about two months ago, and I heard from a lot of residents around about the idea of uh, sewer backups um, uh, throughout the neighborhood. Um, Greenpoint has a lot of old infrastructure, mostly combined, but some not combined um, uh, sewer infrastructure, some blocks that don't have any sewers at all. Um, so uh, I was wondering if, if it's possible uh, that we could work uh, together on um, examining uh, what the sewer infrastructure is in Greenpoint and whether there's um, a need uh, for upgrades. Obviously, there's you know these are massive capital projects that re to replace uh, or uh, improve uh, sewer capacity, but um, it's certainly something that we've been hearing from constituents about up and around the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment facility. Um, on that side of McInnes Boulevard, if you're, as, as you are familiar, of course. So. Yes, we, we are familiar, and be happy to sit down with you and go through that. Great. And just additionally, we've been working with Ben. We're actually coming out to the next meeting to talk with some of our leadership, so we'll definitely follow up. Excellent, excellent. Much appreciated. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Councilmember Ulrich, followed by Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the chair of the committee, thank you very much. I apologize for being late. I uh, was on the subway, so I'll save that for the Transportation Committee hearing and not, uh, I'll spare you the details. Um, uh, but I did have a chance to review the testimony. I want to thank the Commissioner, as always, and uh, his staff for doing a terrific job. They're very responsive in my district, so I have no complaints in particular. Um, but I, I would like an update, if I can, Commissioner, because I didn't see it in the in the, um, the uh, finance papers that we have here on uh, any upgrades or, or announcements or budget allocations for the Rockaway sewer, Sewage Treatment Plan. I know that came up at the Mayor's Town Hall. Uh, and then the other question I have is regarding the uh, Spring Creek facility, which has a big impact on the 
Lindenwood Howard Beach community uh, for me, as you know. So, um, any updates on that, or are you guys looking into anything in the budget? Yeah, we, we, council member, thanks. We, um, you know, heard it loud and clear about odor problems at the the Rockaway plant, and Deputy Commissioner for Wastewater Pam Milardo uh, got her team on it, and I think we've made a lot of big improvements. Uh, over the last six or eight months, just tightening things up, buttoning things up, and getting getting the odor control systems upgraded. So I think we've done well there. We've started, by the way, we're about to start a, a $30 million project at the Rockaway plant to reduce nitrogen discharges. And again, that'll help upgrade some facilities. And, and I, I think that's an Well, that's, that's great news, welcome news. And Chair, maybe um, you know when you're ready to announce that or roll that out, we'll get the Jamaica Bay Task Force people who are involved with the Eco Watchers and the, um, you know, the advocacy of Jamaica Bay. We'd love to get them involved in that because I know that they're really eager to reduce as much nitrogen in, in the bay as possible. They were the, sort of the first ones to ring the bell on that. What about Spring Creek? Any updates on that? We're very concerned about flooding, you know, rainstorms, uh, other events. Yeah, so Spring Creek is a, a combined sewer overflow storage facility that um, had been designed to run unmanned, and we had a glitch and, and flooded uh, some, some property owners, um, and, and restitution had to be made. So. Uh, going forward, we're, we're upgrading the computer system one, but just making sure that when there is heavy rain that somebody is physically there on site to, to have manually open gates if necessary. That's great. There was some talk a few years ago, getting back to Rockaway uh, treatment plant, about making it a pumping station or converting it to a pumping station. How much would that cost? Is that still in a long-term vision? Well, what's the status of that? So so we took a look at that, uh, Council Member. Um, the, the uh, our Rockaway plant is the smallest plant in the system, and the thought was maybe we can pump that wastewater from the Rockaway Peninsula and send it to another plant. Um, but as we costed that out, building a, a, a deep tunnel essentially under Jamaica Bay to get it to one of our plants on the mainland, uh, it was the same cost, if not a little bit more, than just upgrading the facility itself. So and that, that's where we ended up on that. Well, again, I just want to finish uh, uh, thanking the chairs, but uh, thanking you, Commissioner, the, the workers, uh, the DEP workers, not only uh, in the sewage treatment plants, but all the DEP workers. Uh, they're so responsive, so helpful to my staff, to my constituents, and I think they're all doing a great job. And they, they probably deserve a lot more money than they make because they, they put in so much time and energy, and they always try to go above and beyond to try to help people with the particular issues, especially the homeowners with water bills and other issues. So I want to thank you and your staff for, for doing such a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Hey, Council Member Menchaca. Thank you to the chairs, and uh, welcome to the team. And uh, I'll, I'll just give a shout out to Michael Deloche. He's awesome and amazing, and, uh, and we're so happy that he's on your team. Uh, I have a question specifically about working waterfronts, development, uh, storms, all kind of clustering together in one. And I think Red Hook is a great example of that. And I'm really looking forward to dollars in the budget that you're maybe anticipating or is in the budget that you can point to that really kind of think about the extra impacted um, waterfronts with sea levels and rise in storm surges in our communities but specifically to in relationship to development that's happening. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. I can give you a specific question, but that, that's where I'm, I'm kind of looking to see what DEP is thinking about right now. So council member, that they, you know, certainly I, I, I think the city has invested a lot in helping to improve uh, local harbor water quality. And, and that's frankly, I think the reason why we've seen so much, uh, you know, residential development along the waterways is, you know, it was once a place that, you know, was odorous and people didn't want to be at, and and I think that's that's improved a lot. Uh, you know, still challenges with with uh, overflows during wet weather, which which we want to address, um, and certainly climate change is a big challenge for us. Uh, a lot of our our facilities were were uh, located and designed to, to to be at certain elevations, and they were hydraulically uh, you know created to to handle certain capacities and, and you know that's something we, we are always taking a good hard look at. So and I know you're looking at it right so but what I'm looking for is real dedication in the budget that you can point to and say we're looking at it and there's budget and we're gonna we're gonna address it very specifically I'm thinking about storm drain maintenance and record keeping uh, I think a lot of that is uh, and I think your team is working with my team on that right now to figure out 
when when was something recently cleaned? Uh, we want to see connection between development uh, along the waterfronts in the city and potentially clog drains. Those are all things that in real time can help us fight back, uh, especially when there's bad actors in our neighborhoods. And, uh, and really kind of coordinate with all of you to, to hold the developers accountable uh, when construction is impacting our city infrastructure. And I think that, that is where, where I'm hoping that you can kind of point to the budget and say we have, we have the resources ready. Um, I will say that there's specific issues right now that we haven't gotten full information from your team and we're gonna follow up on that. But in general, across the, across the waterfronts, I think that's a real pressure point. Understood, and, and what, whatever records you, you, you'd like to see, council member, obviously, you know, we would we'll be happy to share with you and work with you going forward, thanks. Commissioner, hi, I'm back. <laughs> All right, so I have a few more questions and, and then uh, I think uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, I know in, in, the, in the budget response the council put in, uh, and I know this, I know MOS is not here, I know OR is not here, there are mayoralties, you know my frustration with that, but uh, but it kind of leaves you on the hook to answer questions on sustainability. Uh, you know, we put in uh, 789 million dollars to accelerate uh, the solarization of our city buildings to make sure we get to that law that we just passed two weeks ago that says that we should have all renewable energy sources in our city-owned buildings by 2050. Uh, what is DEP doing um, to make sure that becomes a reality in all of your buildings? Yeah, so we, we've been taking a, a, a number of initiatives, uh, Mr. Chair, to, to reduce our greenhouse footprint. Uh, our wastewater treatment plants are large energy users, and as we treat more wastewater and treat it better, that, that, that puts more uh, stress on our, on our grid. But uh, we've done a bunch of things um, at, at, at our Port Richmond plant. We've installed what, what may still be the largest solar array uh, in New York City, where we generate about one megawatt a day of, of power that helps to, to, to run the plant. Um, at our North River plant, we're installing a cogeneration system that's going to use the, the renewable gas that's produced in the process called digester gas, use that as a fuel to turn engines to, to make both electrical energy and, and heat for, for the facility, and that's going to significantly reduce our greenhouse footprint. And the one last thing I'll mention is that our Newtown Creek plant, where we have those, those iconic egg-shaped digesters, they're very efficient, a lot of capacity. We've actually started to take in some food wastes. Uh, from New York City and digest those and, and make gas there as well and working with National Grid to actually return that excess gas into the, uh, the utility line. So all good stuff. And, and we're continuing to look for more opportunities, right? Because there are things like Bowery Bay that we're not there yet. And, and do we have plans or what, what's sort of the mandate uh, from uh, the mayor's office to look at your agency and say, how do we take your properties? What's our timeline? How do we make sure we get there? Yeah, so, and again, a, a shout out to uh, Deputy Commissioner Pam Millardo. She's actually hired an energy guru uh, recently. And, um, you know, we've been looking at, again, how, how do we track to get from, from where we've been to the, to the mayor's 80 by 50 goal? And um, again, the, you know, I mentioned a few things, but there, there are a lot of other uh, really good initiatives that, that they're undertaking at our facilities. And sort of building upon that, I know we have uh, one NYC that's going to be due next summer. Uh, what's DEP's role? Uh, I know there's more money in the budget this year for planning for one NYC. What is DEP's role uh, in, in that document, and how are you coordinating with the other agencies? So this is something we, we work all the time, uh, Mr. Chair, with the other agencies for, you know, uh, improving our facilities for uh, sustainability and reliability and, and just, um, you know, having equitable services across the board. And so there's a number of things. Again, I mentioned some of, some of the energy initiatives, um, but on the sustainability front, we're just looking to make sure that our facilities uh, are, are ready for, you know, further climate change. We've already been seeing heavier rainfalls, more intense storms, call them cloud bursts. Uh, sea level rise has already been a challenge, and we've been looking to harden our facilities, raise electrical equipment. So we, we can certainly, you know, come to your office and share all those things with you. And I'd love, so you said to hardening your facilities. I mean, just, you know, we've talked about the four. I know there's money in the budget to harden uh, you know, DEP facilities. Uh, how are we, how is that money being spent? Um, what are we sort of looking at in the long term um, to make sure as we see sea level rise, 
uh, not only just what's happening now and the potential of the storms, but we know that in 10 years what these models are going to say when it comes to sea level rise. How are we hardening our infrastructure um, to deal with that potential sea level rise? Yeah, so you know, a, lot of our, a lot of DEP's facilities are right at the, the, the waterfront. Uh, they were put there for a reason because you want sewage to flow by gravity to, to, to get to those sites. But because of that, we now have challenges as, as you know, we get uh, nor'easters or, or even just in uh, some, some more intense storms, we're, we're seeing water rise that, that is affecting some of our facilities. So we've, we've prioritized the equipment at those sites, which are most critical. And as we've, we've been making funding available, those are the things that we've been addressing first. And, how, and when it comes to CSOs and the sewer system in general, how are we looking at potential models for increased precipitation and saying that, you know, it's not only what we're dealing with now, but we have to start planning for 10 years from now as to what this system can handle and how much sewage is going to end up in our waterways based on those models. How, what are we doing on that? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, we could say we designed our sewer system in the past for a five-year storm, but... A five-year storm in 1950 may be a three-year storm today. That's something our, our drainage team uh, is looking at all the time as they're putting new sewers in. Because again, I mean, I, I will, uh, I'll end where I started. Um, you know, I look at uh, some of these CSO issues. I mean, we have a CSO in Howitz Cove in my district. And I know this summer we're in the process of working with ADC to build a brand new uh, environmental uh, kayak launch there. So we're going to get students from, you know, young people from the story of houses uh, into the water for the first time, um, and the CSO is right there. Right, we have residents in, in Flushing Creek near the, the Bland houses that, you know, not too far away from them, we have issues of CSOs. I really look at this as not only as an issue of equity, it's an issue, it's an environmental justice issue. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you to come up with, as you com contemplate not just the current plans, but the future uh, citywide you know, long term control plan. Looking forward to working with you to sort of deal with some of these issues. Thank you, same here. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank we, you, Chair Drum. We're not going to let you off just yet. We have uh, Councilmember Yeager. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair Drum and my chair, Chair Constantides. Uh, just real quickly, Commissioner, a uh, uh, favorite topic of mine in my neighborhood, rain gardens. Um, I love them. Uh, I think they look great when they happen. We haven't actually seen them come in yet, I know, but I've seen them around the city. Uh, we have seen the green markings. Um, and uh, as I understand it, uh, and your team's been great actually in when we identify a special need uh, for an exemption, but uh, the, the as of right exemption is essentially either, you know, one of two cases. Uh, uh, the homeowner has a handicapped uh, parking permit or there is an underground uh, sprinkler system already installed, which your installation of a rain garden would uh, affect. Um, I, my feeling, just based on what I've been seeing, is that uh, some of these, those two as of rights are uh, exemptions are, are pretty narrow. And I'm wondering if you can talk about maybe uh, uh, whether or not there should be broader exemptions, like if it's in front of a house of worship, um, and kind of expanding your, your web page for how to request uh, an exemption from that. Yeah, thank you, Councilman. So, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we're, a little earlier, we've, we've got about 4,000 of those curbside rain gardens uh, in the ground and, and more to come. Uh, a lot of property owners like them. It, you know, greens up the front of their, their space, but we've heard from others that they're, they're happy with the way uh, the front of their, 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 their buildings uh, and sidewalks look. Uh, that all of these, these assets are built in the city right of way, and, and we're looking to expand the, the green infrastructure as much as we, we physically can because, again, it's, it's helping to reduce those combined sewer overflows. Uh, we've, we've, we've worked with, with certain communities about the look and feel of the green infrastructure. Some people in front of their homes, they have just a, a grass strip. Um, and they don't want to see trees and bushes. They just like their grass strips. So we've actually come up with an innovative design uh, for a, a, a curbside rain garden to just look like that. We've been looking at porous pavers, if you want that, that look and feel of, of concrete or stone, uh, some of that. Um, but, but we really wanted to limit the um, opportunities for folks to just opt out for any reasons. And, and that's why we kind of made uh, just narrow uh, reasons for opting out. So if a uh, particular homeowner or an organization or school or anything like that that feels that perhaps the beautiful picture of the very large rain gardens that you have on the website isn't the right fit, they can ask for a, a, a porous 
concrete thing that wouldn't be a rain garden that would be obstruct obstructing the sidewalk, but would actually just, you know, accomplish the purposes of the stormwater runoff uh, 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 deterrence that we're looking for, but without actually putting an obstruction on the sidewalk? That's right. So we okay. have, uh, other than, again, the, the traditional, I'll call it, design with the trees and the bushes, there, there are other options. Okay. If, if just state for the record, if I owned a home, I would love to have one of your lovely rain gardens in front of it. I'm a renter in an apartment. I don't get that right. But I do think they're great. I just, you know, you know, and I think your team's accepted that it's not the right fit, fit for every set of circumstances. We appreciate it, Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thank you very much, and that will end this uh, part of our hearing, and I want to thank you for coming in. I do need to just read this. This concludes our hearing today. This Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 2019 tomorrow, Friday, May 11th, 2018, at 10 a.m. in this room. Uh, the Finance Committee will hear from the Department of Correction. As a reminder, the public will be invited to testify on Thursday, May 24th, the last day of budget hearings at approximately 4 p.m. in this room. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Thank you, and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you very much.